Harry Potter, Journey to Godhood. Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Harry Potter, Journey to Godhood. Chapter 1, Chapter 1, Wool's Orphanage. Wool's Orphanage, a long-standing orphanage in London. It was a square building surrounded by high railings, appearing worn out on the outside but remarkably clean and tidy on the inside. The establishment's founding date was lost to history, and despite its considerable age, it lacked notable achievements. No famous merchants, politicians, or scholars had emerged from here, and it struggled to attract donations or well-intentioned adopters. This was an ordinary, dilapidated, and almost bankrupt orphanage, managed by Mrs. Cole, an ordinary elderly woman. However, in a hidden society inaccessible to ordinary people, this orphanage held an extraordinary reputation that was destined to become even more prominent from this day forward. On this day, June 11, 1991, the orphanage welcomed a special guest. Knock, knock, knock. The sound of knocking reached Mrs. Cole's ears. She set aside her knitting in the rocking chair and hurriedly made her way to the door. On such a rainy day, who would visit such an old orphanage? She wondered, grabbing a black old umbrella from the rack by the door and opening it as she approached. Standing at the door was an old man, tall and thin, with silver hair and a silver beard that reached his waist. Over his robe, he wore a purple cloak and held a dirty black umbrella. His robe was soaked, and droplets covered his half-moon-shaped glasses. Mrs. Cole, sixty years old, felt that this man was much older than her. Strangely, though, despite looking old enough to be her father, he seemed more energetic, his bright blue eyes full of life. Oh, come on in, Mrs. Cole fumbled with a large key from her keychain, struggling to open the somewhat trusted gate to the orphanage. The weather has been terrible lately, and the children's clothes have been left out for two days without drying. That's true, the old man agreed, following Mrs. Cole through the orphanage's main entrance. He looked around, a hint of nostalgia in his eyes. Nothing has changed here, it's still so neat, he sighed. Of course. Mrs. Cole proudly handed a clean towel to the wet old man, saying, We've always been like this. While we may not provide affluent living conditions, we do our best to give the children a good living environment, just as Mrs. Cole did. Unfortunately, not many people come to help us, and not many come to help these poor little ones. As she spoke, the somewhat grumbling old woman couldn't help but complain. Have you been here before? I don't seem to remember you, she asked curiously. Oh, that was many years ago. The old man recalled, around 57, or 58 years ago? I can't quite remember. Mrs. Cole received me back then and provided me with significant help. Then you must be over 80 years old? Mrs. Cole asked casually while preparing tea for the guest. Believe me, I'm older than you imagine. The old man finally dried his beard and hair with a towel, then engaged in conversation with a somewhat lonely old woman. After a while, the satisfied chatterbox of an old woman remembered the main reason for their meeting. So, mister, oh, how rude of me, I forgot to ask for your name. I am Albus. Albus Dumbledore, the old man answered. I am the headmaster of a wizarding school, and I am here to find a boy named Alaric. Oh, Alaric. When mentioning this name, the murky eyes of the old woman seemed to light up. Little Alaric is our pride and joy. There hasn't been a child as intelligent and sensible as him. I've watched him grow up. I've seen all sorts of mischievous and troublesome poor children, you know. It's my profession, but I've never seen such a smart and sensible little boy. Mrs. Cole's face revealed immense pride and joy, and she couldn't help but complain a little. Little Eric could speak at the age of one. Since then, he has never cried or made a fuss, whether hungry or bullied by older children. He always faces difficulties on his own. Oh, he's such a resilient child. Mrs. Cole refilled Dumbledore's tea and continued, This child loves reading. He started reading when he learned to recognize words, newspapers, magazines, dictionaries, novels. He reads everything. His mind is sharp, 
and he learns quickly. He could fluently read newspapers at the age of three. As if introducing her own proud grandson, the old woman spent a long time describing the ten-year-old named Elric. Dumbledore patiently listened, gradually forming a basic impression of the child, intelligent, sensible, eager to learn, hard-working, kind, and so on. Although he knew there might be some subjective bias from the old woman, the overall impression was still near perfection. Chapter 2, Chapter 2, Visitor Then, Dumbledore carefully chose his words, asking Mrs. Cole, Has anything strange or unusual happened to this child? Strange things, upon hearing this term, the smile on the old lady's face instantly disappeared, and she criticized sharply. Little Elric has never experienced anything strange. He is a true good boy, unfortunately encountering such an unfortunate fate. A righteous gentleman would never doubt such a good child. Yes, yes, I didn't doubt him. I just want to have a comprehensive understanding of him. Even Dumbledore, a great wizard and headmaster, couldn't handle the almost hanged old lady at this moment. It took him quite a while to convince her that he had no malicious intent. How is that possible? He thought, the acceptance quilt clearly wrote his name in the book of admittance, proving that he is not a mull or squib, indeed possessing magical talent. Such magical talent often causes various accidents before young wizards learn to control magic, but how could Mrs. Cole, as the administrator, not notice anything? Is it because his talent is too low, or... Thinking of this, he recalled that person and buried the questions and thoughts deep in his heart. Well then. As the conversation concluded, Dumbledore finally made his request. As the headmaster of Hogwarts School, I would like to admit Elric as a student in our school. I came here to deliver his acceptance letter and would like to meet him. Oh, another school's acceptance letter. I knew our little Elric would always be recognized. Mrs. Cole responded cheerfully. But currently, only you, as the headmaster, have come personally. It's up to him to decide. Keep in mind, even Eton College sent him an acceptance letter. Saying this, Mrs. Cole got up from her chair, I'll take you to his room. He should be studying right now. With that, she led Dumbledore up the stairs. In the Wolves' orphanage, Alaric was a legend. When he was only a few months old, Mrs. Cole, who was going out to get the newspaper, found him at the orphanage's door. At that time, he was wrapped in an adult's clothes, and the only thing proving his identity was a plastic card with the words Alaric. From a very young age, Alaric showed his genius. Whether it was learning to speak, walk, or read, he was much faster than his peers. And he was quite sensible, never causing adults any worry. Although Alaric's looks stood out in the orphanage, his maturity and wisdom beyond his age made him easily become the boss of the children there. Whether older or younger, all the children admired him. Since Alaric was five years old, the caregivers at Wool's orphanage felt that their workload had decreased significantly. Under Alaric's management, the children gradually became obedient and responsible. Some older children even willingly helped with household chores. Moreover, in the nearby elementary school, Alaric was a unique genius. In the classroom, no problem could stump him. Teachers and principals praised him, and even after graduating from elementary school, he received an acceptance letter from the prestigious Eton College but no one knew that this famous genius was actually a reincarnator from another world. In his previous life, Alaric was a student in Eldridge University, with a middle-class background. His university was among the top ten in the country. His major was in the highly popular field of computer. Not only was he considered a winner in life, but he also ranked among the upper echelon of his peers. Apart from that, Alaric was a bit of an otaku, well-versed in various anime and movie genres. Before the transmigration, he took advantage of holiday to watch Avengers Endgame. Due to the circumstances of being a loner, he was struck by lightning on the way back to school, and the unfortunate Alaric disappeared without a trace, becoming a momentary urban legend. It was this accident that led to his transmigration. In reality, he wasn't struck dead by lightning. At that time, Alaric only saw a flash of lightning, and a thunderbolt abruptly passed in front of him, splitting the air open with a black crack. Everything, including air, sand, and himself, was sucked into this crack. Only after that did he realize that this was a space rift. And he fell from this opening into an endless and fantastical space. This chaotic space was filled with strange and dangerous currents everywhere. Occasionally, similar cracks appeared suddenly. These cracks only existed for an instant before disappearing, but there was always something sprayed out from the openings, various living and non-living entities, from planets to dust. Then, they were engulfed by the dangerous currents and disappeared without a trace. 
In Alaric's view, this space should be the superdimensional channel connecting the outer edges of the universe to various universes. The space cracks lead to different universes, appearing due to accidents and then repairing themselves instantly. Only in rare cases would substances from the universe be brought into the superdimensional channel, and the turbulent flow was the time-space turbulence. All substances sucked into it would be destroyed and vanish without a trace. Chapter 3, Chapter 3, Rebirth? Transmigration? Since coming here, his daily experience was drifting aimlessly in the chaos between the currents, not born and not dead and he survived by a bizarre stroke of luck, countless times he was almost sucked into the turbulence, but each time he was unexpectedly pulled out by another turbulent current, continuing to drift under the balance of the turbulence's suction. As time passed, he felt changes in his body, his age became younger and younger, his height and body size shrank, and his clothes became increasingly oversized. When his body reached a certain size, he felt his cognitive abilities starting to regress. He felt like his age was reversing and his brain was undergoing retrogression. In this case, even if he wasn't ground into powder by the turbulence, he might disappear due to the reversal of his body's age, turning back into a fertilized egg. However, luck once again favored him. Just before becoming an embryo, he happened to enter a crack and successfully traversed it intact, emerging from the other end, arriving in a new world, right at the doorstep of this orphanage. At this point, he had regressed into a baby. Most of his clothes and personal items were lost in the space-time channel, leaving only underwear and a signed white iron card, giving him the name, Alaric. As Alaric grew up, he began to realize the changes that his experiences in the space-time channel brought to him. These changes made him feel that even though he didn't acquire a system like the protagonists in novels, he could still be considered a chosen one. He discovered that he had the innate ability to learn and grow infinitely. This ability was somewhat similar to Saitama from One Punch Man but different in certain aspects. Any ability, talent, or skill he possessed could infinitely strengthen through continuous learning and training. As long as he trained, his body would become stronger, as long as he learned, he could master new knowledge, by tempering his will, it became more resilient, with diligent thought, intelligence became more developed. This was akin to the absence of limiters in all aspects. Even the talent that determined the speed of progress would gradually strengthen with practice. This made him immersed in learning and training for a long time until he noticed that he was too different from others. He then slowed down his learning. He also found that he had marvelous talents for time and space. He could perceive distances without any reference point and judge the passage of time without a clock. These were undoubtedly benefits from his experiences in the space-time channel. In addition, as he aged, he began to notice that he could unconsciously influence and change matter, he could move cups with his mind, make soup spoons disappear, sense time slowing down when concentrating, and occasionally summon items from other worlds. With a mature inner self and self-control, he gradually eliminated accidents caused by unconscious emotional excitement and, through continuous experimentation, learned to consciously use some magic abilities. Now, he could move lightweight objects with his thoughts and instinctively use some abilities related to time and space. For example, he could briefly control the flow of time in his body like Amir Kiritsuku's innate time control or the bullet time in the Matrix. He could also use summoning spells, they mostly failed, but occasionally, he could summon items from other worlds. Until today, his treasure chest was filled with various strange items from other worlds, including a headband resembling the leaf village from Naruto, a katana that looked like something from Bleach, a master ball, a book titled The Lusty Argonian Maid, all in Nord language but with illustrations, an H-manga by author Kashiwagi Eri, a coin engraved with I hope my sisters can grow up with me and get married together, the coin that Sylvanas Windrunner threw into the Dalaran fountain, and a ring named Durin's lost ring, and so on. Most of what he summoned were non-living objects, with the only exception being a small white cat named Himari, currently lying on the windowsill sunbathing, a cat demon from Omamari Himari. When he first summoned her, she was still a baby, and Alaric personally fed her. Now, Himari was two years old, perhaps due to being a cat demon, she had become quite intelligent and spiritual. Alaric looked forward to the day when Himari could truly speak and transform into a human. Until today, Alaric felt like he had returned to 1980s or 1990s England. He believed that with knowledge and experiences surpassing the era by two or three decades, along with his powerful gift, even without a system, he was confident that he could become the world's richest man in the new era of the internet, reaching the pinnacle of life. Until he opened the door and saw the white-bearded old man in front of him. Hello, 
Ulrich, I am Albus Dumbledore, the headmaster of Hogwarts. Chapter 4, Chapter 4, Dumbledore. Dumbledore? Question mark. Meow meow meow. Where am I? Who am I? What am I doing? Didn't he get reborn 39 years ago, with a cheat and future knowledge? He was planning to use all these things to get rich, marry a beautiful woman, and reach the pinnacle of life. Now, why the hell was Dumbledore showing up out of nowhere? Sigh. I should have known. Isn't this the Wolves Orphanage the place where Voldemort spent his childhood? No wonder the name seems familiar. In this instant, countless thoughts crossed Elric's mind, but in the end, he buried all the doubts in his heart, not revealing any emotions on the surface. Hello, Mr. Dumbledore, and Mrs. Cole. He stepped aside and gestured, please come in and have a seat. Oh, no need, Alaric. Mrs. Cole smiled and waved her hand, Mr. Dumbledore wants to have a private chat with you, so I won't disturb you two. With that, she closed the door. Soon, the sound of creaking stairs descending echoed from outside. Well then, hello child. Dumbledore looked at Alaric kindly, introducing himself, I am the headmaster of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Hello, Mr. Dumbledore. Alaric calmly greeted, but there was a hint of excitement in his eyes. This excitement was not because of meeting Dumbledore, but due to the thrill of transmigrating into a different world. However, it created a misunderstanding for Dumbledore. It seems you're not surprised by the term magic. It looks like you've already realized your uniqueness. Dumbledore raised an eyebrow playfully, snapped his fingers, and Alaric's teacup on the desk automatically filled with tea. Oh, cool. Seeing this scene, Alaric felt a bit envious. However, he also showed off to Dumbledore. The spoon in the tea tray trembled and flew into the cup with a clink. This surprised Dumbledore. He had never seen a young child possess such powerful magic before mastering it. Typically, wizards at a young age had insufficient magical capacity and lacked control over their magic. Even ordinary wizards found it difficult to perform magic without the help of a wand. Although this trick's application of magic was a bit rough, it was relative to adult wizards. It already proved that Alaric was a genuine magical genius. I thought about it when I discovered this superpower. Alaric pretended to explain. I feel that I'm not the only one with magic, or superpowers. But people around me think that magic or superpowers don't exist. I believe there's an organization covering it all up. Perhaps they are like me, and maybe they will come looking for me. You're quite a clever child. So, would you like to join Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry and learn more about magic with your peers? Dumbledore asked kindly. Of course, Mr. Dumbledore, I look forward to my future life in the school. Alaric smiled, revealing a childlike eagerness. Despite being a teenager in his previous life, he was now a young boy and was very excited about being in this childhood fantasy world, especially learning about magic, a book and previously unexplored knowledge. What was the internet? Who cared about the world's richest person? Who cared about beautiful women? None of that mattered now. What wealth could compare to the power of magic? What beauty could surpass Hermione, the know-it-all girl, and the charming Fleur de Lacour, all these leading and supporting female characters? At last who could forget Cho Chang, the most underrated girl in the book? Although the magical world had Death Eaters and Voldemort causing trouble, the overall danger level was not that high, especially since the power of the Light Wizards always stood at its peak. The final crisis only arose because Dumbledore himself set up a plan to permanently defeat Voldemort. Moreover, opportunities and dangers coexisted. Alaric's gift was not like a typical system with clear guidance and a planned path. To further develop his abilities, especially time and space abilities, learning magic seemed like the best idea for now. He also hoped to explore various worlds and experience diverse lives in the future. Next, Alaric and Dumbledore chatted for a while. Although he had some knowledge from books and movies, Ulrich, like a curious child, asked many questions about the magical world. Dumbledore patiently answered each one. Finally, Dumbledore stood up and said, It's getting late now, we should head to Diagonally. There, we can purchase the necessary items for your enrollment in Hogwarts. Do you have enough pounds? Of course, Mr. Dumbledore. Alaric took out his wallet from the drawer, pulled out a stack of pounds, and said, In fact, I've been submitting articles to children's magazines and earned a decent sum in royalties. I think it should be enough. That's good. Dumbledore nodded in satisfaction. Let's get going then. Himari, let's go. Before leaving, Alaric opened his backpack for Himari on the windowsill. The little white cat leapt in skillfully, showing only its head. 
After bidding farewell to Mrs. Cole and the curious onlookers, the two left Bull's orphanage and, led by Dumbledore, entered a deserted alley. Chapter 5 Chapter 5 Diagonally How do we get a diagonally? Alaric was curious. Apparition. It's a convenient spell that makes people uncomfortable. Dumbledore took out his wand. Hold on to me, child, and be careful not to vomit. Alaric felt a blur before his eyes, and then everything started spinning. However, in the chaos, he saw clear spatial patterns, a narrow space channel barely accommodating two people. He felt like being sucked into a narrow rubber tube and then expelled again. The space he originally occupied exchanged places with another. In the blink of an eye, there appeared in an alley. Perhaps due to his innate talent, Alaric didn't feel anything special. Meow. But, the Katamari in his backpack meowed, obviously feeling a little uncomfortable. How do you feel? Dumbledore looked at Alaric with concern. Wizards experiencing apparition for the first time usually have some adverse reactions. I feel great, Alaric reassured as he gently patted the cat's head, finally calming her down. I feel like I can do it a few more times. Oh, you're truly born to be a wizard. Wool's orphanage always produces some geniuses, Dumbledore exclaimed. Of course, the next sentence was just a mutter to himself and not meant for others to hear. The two walked forward in a narrow alley and finally stopped in front of an inconspicuous little pub. The Leaky Cauldron, Dumbledore introduced, this is a well-known place. The Leaky Cauldron is enchanted to ensure that ordinary mulls won't notice it when there's no one leading them. It was a small and dirty pub that people passing by didn't even glance at. Their eyes slid from the large bookstore on one side of the street to the record store on the other, as if they couldn't see it at all. Although it was a famous place in the wizarding world, the inside was dim and dilapidated. Nine elderly women sat in the corner, drinking small glasses of sherry, one of them smoking a long pipe. A young man with a tall hat was chatting with the old bartender. The bartender's head was bald as if it were a swollen walnut. When the two entered, the buzzing chatter immediately stopped, and everyone nodded and smiled politely at Dumbledore, who politely reciprocated each greeting. The barkeeper picked up a glass and said, Professor Dumbledore, are you personally picking up the new student? Yes, a new student from the Mull Orphanage, Dumbledore replied. Is young Harry doing well? He'll be going to Hogwarts this year too. Tom spoke as if bringing up something delightful, and others nearby perked up to listen. Hagrid will be in charge of escorting Harry, Dumbledore explained, then led Alaric into the courtyard, where there was only a wall made of stacked bricks. The entrance to Diagon Alley is here. You must remember the way to enter Diagon Alley, Dumbledore reminded, lightly tapping three times on a special spot on the brick wall with his wand, saying, All right, stand back, Alaric. The brick that was touched by the wand shook and began to move. A small hole appeared in the middle, and the opening grew larger. In no time. They were faced with a wide archway wide enough for both to pass through, leading to a winding, cobbled street with no end in sight. Turning around, Dumbledore opened his arms and said to Alaric, Welcome to Diagonally. Following Dumbledore, Alaric stepped into the magical world for the first time. He understood that his life would bid farewell to ordinary. The fame and fortune of ordinary people would no longer be his pursuit. His future would be accompanied by legends. Everything would begin in this little alley. The alley was filled with various strange shops, street vendors standing on the side, and people buying things. Most of them recognized Dumbledore and nodded in greeting. The old man led Alaric through the alley, nodding to others while introducing each shop and what Alaric could buy in them. Finally, they arrived in front of a snowy white building, much taller than the surrounding small shops. This is Gringotts, Dumbledore introduced. Gringotts is the Wizarding World's Bank. Here, you need to exchange mull currency for wizarding galleons, sickles, and nuts. Next to the shiny bronze door of Gringotts stood a goblin wearing a deep red and gold uniform. They were about a head shorter than Alaric, with a dark and clever face, sharp beard, and long fingers and feet. As they entered, the goblin bowed and greeted them. Then, a second door appeared in front of them, silver, with the following inscription. Enter, stranger, but take heed. Of what awaits the sin of greed? For those who take, but do not earn, must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors, a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware, of finding more than treasure there. Chapter 6, Chapter 6, The Wand. Two goblins bowed to them, guiding them into a grand marble hall. About a hundred goblins sat on high stools behind a row of long counters. Some were weighing coins on copper scales, 
others inspecting gemstones with magnifying glasses, while hastily recording transactions in large ledgers. Alaric approached a counter and took out a stack of British pounds, saying, Hello, I need to exchange pounds for galleons. An elderly goblin approached, taking the pounds. The exchange rate is 5 to 1 for pounds to galleons. Are you sure you want to exchange all 200 pounds into galleons? Yes, Alaric nodded. And also exchange one galleon into sickles. One galleon equals 17 sickles, the old goblin explained. After a while, a younger goblin handed Alaric a heavy bag. Next, Dumbledore took Alaric shopping. Firstly, you need a wand, he said, and Ollivanders makes the best wands. The shop was small and shabby, with a faded gold sign on the door that read, Ollivanders, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. In the dusty showcase, a single one lay on a faded purple cushion. Hello, how are you Ollivander, my old friend? Dumbledore greeted enthusiastically as soon as they entered. A shriveled old man emerged from a corner, warmly embracing Dumbledore. Hello, old friend, he said in a gentle tone of archaic English. How come you have the time to visit me? Oh, just picking up a student from the Mull World, Wool's Orphanage, you know. Dumbledore winked and then introduced. This is him, Alaric. Although born to Mulls, he can already proficiently control his magic. Ah, I see. Ollivander approached, staring sharply at Alaric, and pulled out a long taper measure with silver markings from his pocket. Well, Alaric, let me have a look. Which arm do you use for your wand? I use my right hand, Alaric replied. Raise your arm, good. Ollivander began measuring from shoulder to fingertip. Every Ollivander wand contains a core of powerful magical substance, the essence of its being, Alaric. We use unicorn hair, phoenix feather, and dragon heartstring. Each Ollivander wand is unique because no two unicorns, dragons, or phoenixes are exactly alike. Of course, if you use a wand that belongs to another wizard, the effect won't be as good. Ollivander rambled on while moving between shelves, climbing up and down ladders, and letting the tape measure automatically measure Alaric. Although his constant prattling made Alaric somewhat drowsy, he still listened attentively. Despite having some understanding from the original work, he was still curious about everything in the magical world. All right, Ollivander said, the tape measure falling to the ground and rolling into a ball. Alaric, try this one, made of chestnut and phoenix feather core, twelve and a half inches long. Give it a wave. Alaric took the wand, but as soon as he waved it, he sensed trouble. Indeed, the next moment, the tip of the wand emitted a golden red flame quickly igniting the nearby cabinet in front of him. Alaric almost felt like he was about to summon a live phoenix. Aguamenti, Dumbledore quickly waved his wand, and a gushing stream of water immediately extinguished the flames. It seems this wand isn't suitable for you. Ollivander shook his head, then took out another one. Made of hornbeam and serpent heartstring, nine inches long, give it a try. This time, an unexpected event was a cloud of black smoke. The shrouded cabinet and boxes quickly corroded with unsightly holes, taking considerable effort to restore. Next, Ollivander had Alaric test one wand after another. It seemed that the more trials there were, the happier he became. However, accidents occurred again and again. Ollivander and Dumbledore became cautious, ready with wands in hand to prevent sudden flames, frost, or explosions from causing irreversible consequences. Thanks to the dirty windows of Ollivander's small shop, the pedestrians outside didn't notice any of this. Finally, before the wand box submerged Alaric, Ollivander stopped this unproductive experiment. Oh, what a picky customer indeed, he sighed. Is that orphanage under some spell? This child's magic is even stronger than that guy. Mr. Ollivander, what are you talking about? I don't understand, Alaric said, knowing that guy referred to Voldemort, but at this moment, he still pretended to be ignorant. But Ollivander dryly changed the subject. No, nothing. You'll know it later. Let's get back to the topic of wands. This is the wand I think is most suitable for you. He stumbled, pulling out a delicate purple wand from a large box and handing it to Alaric. Chapter 7, Chapter 7, Designing Uniforms. Guys after looking at voting in previous chapter I have decided to go with name Alaric. Ollivander began introducing this wand. The materials include a tail feather from a particularly ancient phoenix bird and the core of a hundred-year-old elder tree. It is twelve inches long, flexible, and elastic. It's one of my proudest works in my lifetime, and I can't find such precious materials again. I can't make a more powerful wand than this. I just hope this wand won't have any more accidents, 
Ulrich, exhausted by the frequent surprises, had no energy to consider whether the wand was powerful. He just wanted to end these experiments quickly. However, he still cautiously took the wand. At the moment he took the wand, all the wands in the small shop trembled. A strange sensation transferred from the wand to his hand, a smooth and submissive feeling, as if he could effortlessly perform magic. Alaric waved the wand gently, and this time, there were no surprises. The tip of the wand sparkled with a brilliant silver light, and then all the wand tremors ceased. Excellent. Truly excellent. Ollivander exclaimed loudly. To witness my life's greatest work find its true owner in my lifetime is truly an honor. He then turned to Alaric and reminded, a wand with a phoenix feather core is powerful and extremely picky about their owners, especially when it comes from a phoenix king. An elder wand is even more challenging to control and demands the highest talent from the user. Wizards who can use an elder wand are truly destined for greatness. As the owner of such a wand, you are destined to have a great future. When he said the last sentence, he looked at Dumbledore. Dumbledore smiled slightly, Child, I'm glad you have this wand. I'm starting to look forward to your performance at Hogwarts. Alaric put away the wand satisfactorily and asked, So, how much for this wand? No, no need for money. Ollivander looked at the wand reluctantly and refused. To see my life's greatest work meet its true owner, I am already very satisfied. I hope you can use it well. Watching Dumbledore and Alaric leave, Ollivander muttered to himself, another one from Wool's Orphanage, and such a genius again. No, even more incredible than that person. I hope he won't follow in that person's footsteps, otherwise, the magical world will. Next, we need to get you a set of Hogwarts uniforms. After leaving the wand shop, Dumbledore said, Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions, we usually go there. Madame Malkin was a short and chubby witch with a friendly smile, dressed in purple. Are you buying Hogwarts school uniforms, dear? Before Ulrich could speak, she said, Oh, hello, Professor Dumbledore. Are you here to personally pick up a student? Sorry, I didn't notice you just until now. The two greeted each other with smiles. Alaric noticed another young man coming out from the back, slightly shorter than him. Thanks to his continuously growing body, he was taller than most peers. He was wearing a dull and old-fashioned black robe, which Alaric found extremely ugly. Excuse me, is that the Hogwarts uniform? He pointed helplessly at the young man. Oh, yes, dear. Madame Malkin led Alaric to a high stool. But if you're not satisfied, you can ask for some lace or something. Oh, and can you stand on this stool? I need to measure your size. Alaric was still dissatisfied with this old-fashioned robe. He made an unexpected request, can I design my own robe and then customize it here? Design your own robe? Madame Malkin's voice immediately rose eight degrees. No one has ever made such a request here. We are professionals. But if you insist, it's not impossible. The last sentence was much quieter, apparently, Alaric's request hurt her feelings, and she felt her professionalism was being underestimated. So, Alaric skillfully drew a sketch on paper. It was the uniform of the Majors Association students from the type Moon World, slightly shorter than a Hogwarts robe, more stylish in design, and seemed to be a product of combining Mull World design styles. In addition, he drew matching shirts, vests, trousers, and so on. Dumbledore and Madame Malkin stood behind Alaric, curious to see what he could draw. As Alaric's skillful strokes gradually shaped the clothing, the two began to take a serious look. I must say, your new student is indeed a genius, Madame Malkin exclaimed to Dumbledore. This is not something an ordinary child can design. If he becomes a fashion designer, he should be able to make a lot of money, a big profit in galleons. Dumbledore nodded empathetically. Since meeting Alaric today, the surprises he brought had not stopped. Finally, after finishing the drawing, Alaric stopped, and Madame Malkin immediately took the drawing and carefully examined it. Chapter 8 Chapter 8 Shopping and Departure You're amazing, my dear. I've never seen such a beautiful design. After carefully examining each sketch, Madame Malkin exclaimed. Oh, these are all mull style. Alaric modestly shook his head. So, can I order such a set of uniforms? Of course. I can't wait to see what the finished product looks like. Madame Malkin looked a bit excited. Then, she hesitated and asked Alaric, if, I mean, if you allow me to make uniforms of the same style for others, then during your seven years at Hogwarts, I will custom make a well-fitting set of uniforms for you every year with the best materials, what do you think? Madame Malkin looked at Alaric expectantly, and Alaric thought it wasn't a bad deal for him, so he readily agreed. After that, 
They went to Flourish and Blot's bookstore to buy textbooks. Alaric not only bought a complete set of first-year textbooks but also purchased all the textbooks for charms and transfiguration up to seventh grade. In addition, the curious Alaric also bought a book titled Introduction to Ancient Magic and Rune Scripts and Hogwarts, a history. Although you are still young, I am glad there is someone interested in ancient magical scripts, Dumbledore commented when he saw Alaric's choices. Last semester, only two students chose to study ancient magic and runes, which is too few. I'm sure Professor Babbling will like you. He added later, however, ancient runic scripts of magic are a bit challenging, so I hope you are mentally prepared. I just want to study how magic came to be, Alaric picked up Introduction to Ancient Magical Scripts and flipped to the title page. This book says that modern spells are simplified versions of ancient magical and runic scripts, and the creation of magical items is also related to ancient magical scripts. I think by studying these scripts, I can find out where the power of magic comes from. I must say, you will definitely end up in Ravenclaw in the future. Dumbledore looked at him with a pleased expression. After inquiring about the significance of each house, Alaric commented, A wizard's power comes from knowledge, so wizards who pursue knowledge can be considered true wizards. In this regard, Ravenclaw is indeed more in line with my preferences. After paying, Alaric was faced with a pile of thick books. It was impossible for his small backpack to hold so many books. Helpless, Alaric could only look at Dumbledore with pleading eyes. You can use the shrinking charm to shrink these books and then put them in your backpack, Dumbledore took out his wand and lightly tapped the book pile. Reducio. These books immediately shrank several times until each book was the size of a fingernail. Himari, who saw this scene, curiously approached and stared at these miniature books. If you want them to return to their original size, the spell is in Gidio, Dumbledore added. Alaric, interested, took out his new wand and imitated Dumbledore's posture. He pointed at the tiny books and said the spell. Ingadio. The fingernail-sized books expanded until they returned to their original size. Himari, caught off guard, was hit on the nose by one of the enlarged books, and she retreated into the backpack with a startled meow. Alaric comforted her by patting her head. Be careful, little one. Then, he tried to cast another spell on the books. Reducio. Immediately, the books shrank back to the size of a fingernail. Dumbledore. Watching on the side, was amazed. Alaric had only seen him cast the shrinking charm once, but he could immediately learn it and successfully cast it perfectly the first time. Moreover, he could generalize from it and successfully cast the engorgement charm. Such talent and learning ability were unprecedented. Although you have heard it several times today, I still have to say, you are indeed a genius. He praised. Alaric put all the shrunken books into his backpack, and after reminding Himari not to play with the books, he followed Dumbledore to purchase other items. In the cauldron store, Alaric bought a large cauldron made of tin, which could be folded and automatically stirred. He also bought a set of glass and crystal potion bottles, a telescope, and a measuring scale. In the magical pet store, he refused to buy an owl and decided to find a way to summon a magical creature for delivering letters. However, he did buy some expensive cat food for Himari. He believed that wizard cat food might be more suitable for a cat demon than mul cat food hoping that this would help Imari grow faster, at least awakening her demon power sooner. This series of expenses left his money pouch, originally plump, completely empty. This made him determined to use his advantage as a reincarnator and the power of magic to make a big profit in the mull world during the next summer vacation. Not being able to buy the best cauldron and experimental equipment made him feel ashamed about his identity as a reincarnator. In Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlor, Dumbledore treated Alaric to an ice cream, while he himself bought a cockroach cluster, which made Alaric feel nauseous. Finally, using the apparition, Dumbledore sent Alaric back near the orphanage. Before leaving, Dumbledore said to him, Alaric, you are a true genius and a kind-hearted good child. I hope you use the power of magic wisely. Remember, what defines a person is not their power but how they decide to use that power. After saying that, he playfully winked and disappeared in front of Alaric. A.N. If you like this story then do leave some comments, reviews and power stones, it really motivates me. Chapter 9, Chapter 9, King's Cross Station After returning from Diagon Alley, Alaric locked himself in his room and began to study the magic of this world. Through experiments and research, he roughly understood the principles of magic in this world. It was a kind of spell that used magic to influence the rules. 
The generation of magic comes from living beings themselves, so only wizards and magical creatures with magic can cast spells. Using magic in this world requires strong will, proper pronunciation, and gestures. The strong will determines the target and effect of the magic, while pronunciation and gestures are essential catalysts. Through these, magic can directly achieve results by influencing the rules. Compared to directly using magic to forcefully impact the reality of the world, magic in this world is like completing tasks directly through a console in and rebounds per game game. It is not only more effective but also allows for spells like the disillusionment charm, the levitation charm, and others that completely violate the basic rules of energy conservation and entropy increase. As for wands, it is well known that magical creatures in this world possess stronger magic than wizards. Wands are made from materials on these magical creatures and some special woods, serving as organizers and converters of magic. When a wizard becomes familiar enough with a spell and is proficient in casting it, they can omit the incantation and wand movements, casting spells silently, with their bare hands, a wandless magic. This is known as non-verbal and wandless casting, making the casting process faster and less predictable. However, due to the lower catalytic effect of silent casting and the lower efficiency of handling and converting magic without a wand, the spell's effect is much weaker and less efficient. With Elric's talent, he quickly learned relatively simple and commonly used magic such as the wand lighting charm, levitation charm, and disillusionment charm, but he couldn't learn more complex spells in his room. On the one hand, knowledge like spellcasting and potion making requires suitable facilities and materials, and on the other hand, more complex spells are not only prone to irreparable accidents but may also attract the attention of Mrs. Cole and his other friends in the orphanage. Unable to quell his curiosity about magic, Alaric could only endure it and look forward to the day when school started. The wait was always long, but finally, the time came for September 1st. Alaric arrived at King's Cross Station at 9 o'clock hoping to enter the train early and have the freedom to choose a compartment without having to stay with people he wasn't interested in. Except for the main characters, only George and Fred Weasley, Cedric Digree, and attractive girls could catch his attention at Hogwarts. At this time, the crowd at the train station was not small, there were quite a lot of people coming and going at the train station. Standing between platforms 9 and 10, Alaric carefully looked around hoping to find an opportunity to enter platform 9 and 3 quarters without anyone noticing. Soon, several wizards in strange robes walked in front of him, foolishly bumping into the wall with a silly expression on their faces, and then one by one, they disappeared. Alaric gritted his teeth, suppressing the desire to complain about their lack of manners, and followed these people into the wall leading to platform 9 and 3 quarters. In the blink of an eye, he felt like he had passed through a door, and then the scenery changed dramatically. In front of him was an old-fashioned red steamer locomotive with a sign reading Hogwarts Express. With Elric's talent, he could clearly feel that he was in a special space, a space that coincided with the original location of King's Cross Station. It's really unscientific, reaching such a level with magic. He exclaimed, following the crowd onto the train. At this time, there were not many people in the train compartments, but Elric still sat in a slightly later compartment with an empty space. He noticed that the older wizards tended to sit towards the front, while the new students were concentrated in the last few compartments. After putting away his luggage, Alaric opened his backpack, released Imari, who had been confined inside for a long time, and then took out a book, Hogwarts, a school history, to start reading. Perhaps same age young wizards would be bored with this kind of reading material, but for him, it was a decent pastime. Imari meowed, rubbing against Alaric's legs, showing signs of wanting to play with her master. However, Alaric was enjoying himself at the moment. He casually took out a fragrant grilled fish jerky from his bag, gave it to Himari, and then casually petted her head. That should be enough to pass the time for her. Himari had no choice but to hold the dried fish in her mouth and walk out of the compartment to roam around. Alaric was quite at ease about this. After all, Himari was a cat demon, although still young, her intelligence was enough to take care of herself. After a while, she ran back to the compartment in a hurry and pounced into Elric's arms, as if someone was chasing her. No, someone was indeed chasing her. It was a girl who looked about the same age as Elric, with thick brown hair and a pair of large front teeth. She was already wearing the Hogwarts uniform, and Elric immediately recognized her because she looked very similar to Emma Watson. Hermione Granger the female protagonist of the Harry Potter series, the clever know it all girl, who consistently held the top spot in her grade. However, 
J.K. Rowling arranged for her to end up with Ron, which was quite regrettable. Chapter 10, Chapter 10, Hermione and Cho Chang The moment he saw her, Alaruk's first thought wasn't about his long-imagined strategy of making friends with main characters. Instead, he wondered how and why the story of this Harry Potter world was written into a novel and then adapted into a movie in his original world. He pondered why the movie's female lead resembled the real Hermione Granger of this world to such a great extent but wasn't an exact match. He didn't believe that the Harry Potter world was created because of the existence of the Harry Potter series of novels and movies. On the contrary, he was more inclined to believe that the Harry Potter world influenced his world, leading to the creation of these works. Currently, he couldn't prove this point, but he believed that, with his learning and research on magic, combined with his innate talent for time and space abilities, he would undoubtedly find a way to travel between these different worlds. He felt that with each journey through different dimensions, he would uncover the truth. Coming back to reality, Alaric began to assess the girl standing in front of him who was very famous back in his home world. She was an arrogant girl, like a swan with a stretched neck. In terms of appearance, she was still very cute, a beauty in the making. Is this cat yours? She asked, without any pleasantries or self-introduction. Can I touch it? Meow Himari whimpered, retreating into Alaric's backpack, only revealing a pair of bright eyes observing from the shadows. Of course not, you scared Himari. Alaric raised an eyebrow, unable to fathom what the girl had done to frighten Himari to this extent. Himari? Why did you give your cat such a name? Is it a magical language? Hermione asked curiously, seemingly completely diverted. No, it's Japanese, meaning Himari. Alaric explained. Oh, you're Japanese? Hermione nodded as if understanding. Not really. Then, why did you give your cat a Japanese name? Because I like it. Hermione's consecutive questions left Alaric somewhat amused. He hadn't expected her curiosity to reach such levels. Fortunately, the girl stopped and shifted to another topic. I'm Hermione Granger, she introduced herself. I come from a Mo family, and no one in my family understands magic. So when I received the acceptance letter, I was extremely surprised but also very happy because, I mean, from what I know, this is the most excellent wizarding school. But still I've memorized all the textbooks, so I can catch up with all of you. So, what's your name? She spoke very fast, finishing a long paragraph of self-introduction in one breath like a rapid-firing machine gun. She also took the opportunity to show off her learning abilities. What a girl! Alaric sighed inwardly and then introduced himself, I'm Alaric. I come from a mal orphanage, so I'm not sure if I have wizarding blood. Oh, and by the way, do you want to sit here? Alaric invited. This invitation was not only out of curiosity but also because he wanted to test whether the so-called plot could be changed and this experiment started with Hermione. He planned to influence Hermione to join Ravenclaw instead of Gryffindor. This would undoubtedly have a massive impact on the plot, and the future might change drastically. Additionally, he genuinely believed that Hermione's intelligence and eagerness to learn were more suitable for Ravenclaw, hoping that close proximity with one of the main leads would influence some of the choices was also one of his hidden intentions. Hearing that Lyric came from a mole world, Hermione immediately felt that their relationship had become much closer. She gladly accepted the invitation, sitting opposite Alaric. And they started talking about the magical world that had suddenly appeared in their lives, changing it completely. Obviously, Having read through the original Harry Potter books, Alaric's insights and knowledge about this world far surpassed Hermione's. Moreover, with his extraordinary learning abilities, the young girl soon realized that maintaining her pride in this aspect was not easy. I have met my match, my rival. Hermione thought to herself, but at the same time, she acknowledged that Alaric was indeed an outstanding peer who excelled in studies and had great academic achievements. At this moment, there was another knock on the compartment door. Alaric opened the door, and outside stood two girls a bit older than Hermione. One had freckles with brown hair, and the other was a black-haired Asian girl. The latter seemed to be dragged along reluctantly, both holding luggage in their hands. Hello, my name is Marietta, the brown-haired girl introduced herself. This is my good friend Cho Chang. We both saw you outside and noticed you were new here, also there was still some free space in your compartment, so we thought we'd come and get acquainted. Hello, the black-haired girl nodded towards Alaric. Alaric introduced himself to Marietta and Hermione, then turned to Cho Chang and said hello, Cho Chang, I'm Alaric. Seeing him, Cho Chang opened her mouth in surprise. Hello, I didn't think you were new here, just because how calm you were while boarding the train. 
Ah, it wasn't too challenging, we simply went in the direction everyone else was heading, Alaruk said with a smile. Dot. Chapter 11, Chapter 11, Joining Ravenclaw? The talk between Alaric and the two girls was going smoothly and they were standing very close to each other, not paying attention to anyone around them. This made Hermione quite uncomfortable, and she felt that she was being ignored. What on earth are you all discussing about standing so closely? Hermione protested. Can't you see I am also here? Calm down, Hermione, Alaric shrugged and turned to Marietta. So, would you like to come in? There's still space here. Of course, Marietta readily nodded and pulled the hesitating Cho Chang into the compartment. With the addition of the two girls, everyone became a bit reserved. No one spoke, and the atmosphere became awkward. Ultimately, Marietta broke the ice. She glanced at Alaric and then at everyone, and somewhat reluctantly asked, Alaric, you look beautiful. Ah dot thanks, but how can you call a man beautiful, you should instead use handsome, Alaric complained. However, the truth was, as handsome as he was, he could indeed still be called beautiful. Mrs. Cole had more than once expressed that if Ulrich were to cross-dress, he would be cuter than any girl. Hearing Marietta's comment, both Hermione and Cho Chang earnestly scrutinized Ulrich, then blushed and looked away simultaneously. The atmosphere became even more awkward. Helplessly, Ulrich recalled his original purpose, getting Hermione into Ravenclaw. So, he deliberately asked, Are you two also first-year students? No, we entered Hogwarts last year and now we are already in our second year, Cho Chang shook her head. I am your senior in this school, so you should call me with respect, Marietta added. All right, senior, Alaric rolled his eyes. So, which house are you in? We're both in Ravenclaw, the two girls said in unison. Ah, Ravenclaw, Alaric pretended not thoughtfully. I hope I'll also be sorted into Ravenclaw this year. How about you, Hermione? Gryffindor. Hermione replied, I heard they say Gryffindor is the best. Gryffindor is not the best, Ravenclaw is, Cho Chang retorted. Exactly, Marietta agreed. People from Gryffindor always try to sell their house to others, but in reality, they're just a bunch of stupid and reckless fools. You're biased, Hermione pointed out sharply. No, I also think Ravenclaw is the best, Alaric supported Cho Chang and Marietta, explaining, wizards gain power through knowledge. Ravenclaw represents wisdom and knowledge, which is what wizards should pursue. He concluded, although courage, diligence, and shrewdness are essential for wizards, wisdom and knowledge are their essence. Marietta and Cho Chang both clapped. Well said. You'll surely become an excellent Ravenclaw. Professor Flitwick will be pleased to meet you. After carefully considering Alaric's words, the proud Hermione had to nod, I have to admit your reasoning. Now, I also hope to be sorted into Ravenclaw. Saying this, her face turned slightly red. Unfortunately, sorting is ultimately decided by the sorting hat. If you're unlucky, you might be sorted into another house, Marietta regretfully reminded. However, having read the original work, Alaric immediately came up with a solution. I heard from others that there is a way to influence the sorting hat's decision. As long as you keep thinking about which house you want to be in, the sorting hat will take your opinion into consideration. You can give it a try. If successful, we can stay in the same house. When he said the last sentence, he stared seriously into Hermione's eyes. Blushing under the gaze of such a handsome guy, Hermione's face turned red as she whispered, Understood, I will try. Next, the four of them enthusiastically discussed Ravenclaw. Cho Chang and Marietta introduced Ravenclaw House, and then Alaric and Hermione gave their evaluations. Cho Chang and Marietta sometimes agreed and supported sometimes vehemently opposed, and then continued the introduction, creating a lively cycle. The four of them chatted happily, not even noticing that the train had already departed. At around half past twelve, a smiling, dimple-faced woman pushing a trolley passed by the compartment. All four bought some snacks from her and happily exchanged and debt. Alaric declined Marietta's Bertie Bot's every flavor beans, as he didn't want to risk tasting flavors like Booja. However, Hermione was interested and boldly ate several, only to be scorched by a chili-flavored bean, making her gulp down several cups of water. What truly caught Lyric's interest were the chocolate frogs, particularly the collectible moving cards. These cards with animated characters gave him a bold idea, to use this technology to create a collectible trading card game, similar to Magic, The Gathering, UGIO, or Hearthstone. 
he knew that in the wizarding world, games like wizard chess were popular, and collecting chocolate frog cards was a widespread hobby. Therefore, developing a trading card game in the wizarding world would undoubtedly have potential, and he could use this as an opportunity to become wealthy. He even thought of hiring Ravenclaw students to develop and manufacture the cards. This technology wasn't particularly advanced in the field of alchemy, and students would likely be willing to earn some extra galleons during their free time. During this period, he could identify truly talented young wizards and officially hire them after graduation. I'm a genius, Alaric thought, feeling a bit proud of himself. However, his thoughts were interrupted by an unexpected event. Chapter 12, Chapter 12, Neville, Harry, Ron, and Conflict. A round-faced chubby boy knocked on the compartment door. Sorry, he said dearfully, I wanted to ask, have you seen my toad? All four shook their heads, and he immediately burst into tears. I've lost it again. It always tries to run away from me. It's okay, we'll help you find it together, Hermione volunteered. Then, she suddenly remembered something and turned to ask, you all will help too, right? Of course, this fits Hermione's character. Thinking this, Alaric reluctantly stood up and replied, Fine, I'll help look too. Cho Chang and Marietta looked at each other, initially ready to mind their own business, but seeing the new friends they'd just made, they sighed and reluctantly joined the search. Seeing this scene, the round-faced boy was moved to tears. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm Neville Longbottom. Thank you for helping me find Trevor. Alaric comfortingly patted his head. It's okay, we're all classmates, and classmates should help each other. Besides, he paused, a bit proud, finding things should be left to the professionals. Under the puzzled looks of the others, he shouted, Himari. With a meow, a cute little white cat emerged from Elric's backpack and gracefully leapt into the boy's arms. What a cute kitten! Cho Chang and Marietta, who hadn't noticed Himari before, were instantly captivated. Elric affectionately patted the cat's head. Himari, we're looking for a toad. Its owner is him, remember? While saying this, he pointed to Neville. Himari approached, sniffed Neville's scent, and then meowed to show understanding. Satisfied, Alaric nodded and put Himari on the ground. Let's go then, he ordered. With his command, Himari elegantly strolled down the train corridor, sniffing the air as she walked. Alaric led Neville and the three girls behind. Can she really understand what you're saying? Hermione asked. Yes, Himari has intelligence similar to humans, so... Of course, she can understand, Alaric replied. Then she must be a magical creature, Marietta concluded. Is she a nasal, or a cat with nasal ancestry? No, Himari is a cat demon, the boy denied. A.N. Himari is actually a cat demon from anime memory Himari. But I thought, it was a magical creature. Yeah, I also don't think this cat is a demon, it may be a magical creature, Hermione eagerly answered. But this cat could indeed be a demon. Cho Chang nodded. My dad told me that any creature, any animal, has the potential to become a demon if given the chance. Terrifying. Why would you raise a demon? If it were me I would have never kept one. After hearing this, Neville was startled and involuntarily slowed down, walking to the back of the group. What's so scary about it? Himari is so cute. Exactly, Himari is not scary at all. Coward. The girls expressed disdain towards Neville. Generally, girls would be more afraid of strange things like this, but Himari's cuteness had captivated them. They all expressed, even if she is a demon, as long as she is cute, there's no problem. Indeed, in this world, beauty is justice. Alaric, somewhat emotional, patted his own face. It seems that my future is absolutely bright. After walking along the corridor for a while, Himari suddenly stopped, then entered a compartment. The five immediately followed. In the compartment, Two boys were facing each other. One had black hair and glasses, and the other was a red-haired boy. Their clothes were a bit worn, and their appearances resembled the characters from the movies. Alaric guessed their identities at a glance. Harry Potter, the chosen one, and his sidekick, Ron Weasley, the one who would later marry Hermione. On the table in the compartment were snacks and wrappers. It seemed they were originally enjoying some food, but now, the black-haired boy curiously looked at Himari, while the red-haired boy huddled in fear, holding a squeaking mouse in one hand and a shabby wand in the other, randomly pointing it at Himari. There seemed to be a green light coming out of the tip of the wand. Alaric was startled by his actions, recalling that in the original book, Ron often had accidents when casting spells. Expelliarmus. 
Alaric flicked his wrist, and a purple wand appeared in his hand. A red light shot out from the wand tip and instantly hit the red-haired boy. He let out a miserable cry, and the wand in his hand flew out. With his other hand, Alaric casually reached out and effortlessly caught the flying wand. Cool! The boy with glasses exclaimed in admiration. You actually know magic, what's the name of that spell? Hermione asked excitedly. Cho Chang and Marietta were also impressed by this electrifying scene, applauding him with admiration. Thank you. Alaric nodded at them, then bent down and returned the shabby one to Ron. Sorry about that, I didn't mean to do this, but next time, please don't point your wand at my Himari. Ron hesitated for a moment, then nodded in understanding, clutching his wand tightly. Himari, after completing her mission, jumped back into Alaric's backpack with a satisfied look on her face. Chapter 13, Chapter 13, Toads and the Chosen One Affected by Alaric's disarming charm, Ron Weasley seemed frightened. Even his speech was stuttering, I, I unders, understand. He swallowed hard, finally regaining composure. I, I don't like cats, I thought she came in to eat scabbers. Himari would never eat such strange things. Alaric shook his head. He knew that Scabbers, the rat, was actually the animagus Peter Pettigrew. However, he didn't intend to expose Peter, as doing so would put himself in a suspicious situation. How does a mole who just entered the magical world know so much? Himari, in response, also mewed and distanced herself from Ron and his rat, apparently sensing something peculiar about Scabbers. Alara casually picked up Himari and introduced himself to Harry and Ron. He also introduced the other four. Finally, he explained, we came here to help Neville find his toad. But Neville was sitting in this compartment originally, Harry Potter pointed out, puzzled. Neville behind them nodded in agreement. Now, the girls cast skeptical glances at Alaric. Watch, Himari never makes mistakes, Alaric sneered, and Himari cast a disdainful glance at the others, expressing her disdain for their doubts. She leapt from Alaric's shoulder, gracefully landed on a suitcase, and then used her cat's claws to scratch it. This is my luggage, Neville blurted out. Alaric gestured for him to open the bag. Himari means to say that your toad is hiding inside. Trevor can't be in there. I personally organized the suitcase, and I would have known if Trevor were in there, Neville muttered, but reluctantly opened the suitcase under Alaric's insistence. As expected, in line with Alaric's expectations, as soon as the suitcase was opened, a toad, as if finally liberated, jumped out. With the appearance of the toad, the truth was revealed. Neville had wasted a considerable amount of time going through each compartment, asking about Trevor. But in reality, Trevor had been left in his suitcase the entire time. Himari lifted her chin triumphantly, strutting back and forth before the group, looking like a proud rooster. Watching her adorable and proud demeanor, the girls' hearts melted. They spared no praise, thinking about how they could personally touch Himari. However, Himari ran back into her master's arms with an indifferent look, showing no love for the compliments from the girls. With the matter resolved, the two groups, who had just clashed moments ago, began introducing themselves. When the black-haired boy wearing glasses said his name, Harry Potter, there was an exclamation of surprise. Is it really you? Hermione was excited. I know everything about you. Of course, I bought a few extra reference books. A History of Modern Magic, The Rise and Fall of Dark Arts, Important Magical Events of the Twentieth Century, all of which mention you. Hearing this, Harry Potter had a bewildered expression, he never knew he was so famous. But, as a typical figure who fought against the Dark Lord and escaped death, Harry had long become a celebrity in the wizarding world. Cho Chang and Marietta couldn't help but take a closer look at him. Cho Chang had mostly lived in the Mull world, only entering the Wizarding world a year ago, so she had no real feelings about this. But Marietta was different, she even wanted to go forward and ask Harry for an autograph. Compared to them, Alaric was much calmer. He expressed a bit of surprise, then had brief conversations with both Harry and Ron, the latter being somewhat neglected in Harry's shadow. Harry felt that Alaric wasn't just interested in his fame. While Ron was touched that Alaric didn't only pay attention to the renowned Harry Potter but also acknowledged him. Now, even the conflict a few minutes ago, where Alaric disarmed Ron's wand, was completely forgotten. Following that, Alaric bid farewell to them along with the girls and left. As they left, Ron cast an envious and jealous glance at Alaric's back. He's just a bit better looking, isn't he? Ron complained to Harry. He can sit in the same compartment with three girls. Although he's a good guy, I bet anyone who walks with him wouldn't be noticed by any girl. 
Harry nodded in agreement. Although both of them thought Alaric was a good guy, boys tend to unite in their resentment against handsome guys. The so-called handsome guy, holding him Ari, returned to the compartment with the three girls in a somewhat helpless manner. On the way, Hermione kept chatting with Marietta about Harry Potter and Voldemort. The two, one having read many books about the magical world and the other with parents working in the Ministry of Magic, were well informed, engaging in gossip topics and occasionally exclaiming in surprise. Cho Chang, on the other hand, listened attentively to their conversation, occasionally chiming in. Only Alaric, who wasn't very interested in gossip, had nothing to say and could only read his own book. Dot. Chapter 14 Chapter 14 Disarming Charm and Scientific Theories Reading alone wasn't boring for Alaric, but soon the girls shifted the topic to him. They discussed the spell he used and how he took out his wand. Hermione, who loved digging into details, was the first to ask him a question. What spell did you use just now? she inquired. You instantly disarmed that redhead's wand. That was the disarming charm, Alaric casually replied. It's the most commonly used spell in wizard duels, and the incantation is Expelliarmus. I know that. Marietta chimed in eagerly. I remember, this charm was mentioned in defense against the dark arts class. But the teacher said we would learn it in higher grades. You can actually use such a complicated spell. How did you do it? Hermione, also a Melbourne born like Lyric, was visibly affected. She couldn't wait to ask him for tips. Actually, Alaric explained, this spell is not complicated. It's even considered the simplest among the spells used in direct confrontation. Although it doesn't have a powerful offensive effect and can be easily blocked by various counter spells, it has an advantage that surpasses other spells. What advantage is that? Hermione asked impatiently. It's the shortest incantation among dual spells, and it can be cast the fastest. Using this spell often gives the caster the advantage of taking the initiative in magical duels. Upon hearing this explanation, Cho Chang and Mariette nodded in understanding, feeling admiration for Elric's extensive knowledge. However, Hermione was still dissatisfied, she questioned, I have never seen such an answer in any book, Expelliarmus having the shortest incantation. Where did you read that? I haven't seen anyone mention the length of incantations in any magical books. This is my own conclusion. I compared several relatively simple dual spells, such as the Stunning Spell, the Impediment Jinx, the Full Body Bind Curse, and the Dancing Feet Spell. After that, I arrived at this conclusion, Alaric replied. But since it's not mentioned in any books, how can you ensure that this is the correct conclusion? Remember, these books were written by the greatest wizards. Even they didn't say this. What makes you think you are right? Hermione challenged. Such a proud girl, unwilling to admit defeat at any time. Let me teach you a lesson. Thinking so, Alaric sternly criticized Hermione. Miss Hermione Granger, I assume you haven't studied mull science seriously since being admitted to Hogwarts, have you? Well, not really, but what does that have to do with mull science? Hermione blushed a bit and asked back. It has a lot to do with it. Although mull science lacks convenience and magic, it is very worthwhile to study in terms of logic and problem solving methods, even in the study of magic you can add a thing or two, it can be used as a reference. For example, when researching the duration of incantations, I only need to maintain my magical power and energy in an equally abundant state. Using the same volume, the same speed, and clear pronunciation, I cast different spells and record the time taken for each. This way, I can roughly compare the lengths of the incantations. This is the controlled variable method used in science, Alaric explained seriously. Finally, he concluded. The spirit of science tells us that practice is the only way to find the truth. Blindly believing in authority is not advisable. Even the theories of the great scientist like Newton have been proven not to be absolute truths in modern times, and they have limitations in many aspects. So, why do you think that the wizards who wrote these textbooks are absolutely correct? After all, magic is not as rigorous as science in terms of precision. If these predecessors' words are completely correct, how are new spells created? After all, their books did not mention these spells. Following your reasoning, the entire wizarding world would never progress. This explanation left Marietta, who came from a wizarding family, confused. Indeed, many wizards lacked logical reasoning abilities. But Hermione Granger, who came from a Mull family and had long been in the Mull world, barely understood what Alaric was saying. This kind of thinking, I've never heard of it before. Cho Chang looked admiringly at her fellow Mullborn. 
using scientific methods to study magic, you're really a genius. Hermione, on the other hand, felt a bit teary-eyed from Elric's words. She had always considered herself intelligent and was unwilling to admit defeat to Elric. However, Elric's theory was reasonable, leaving her unable to refute. She found herself in an embarrassing situation. She wanted to argue but couldn't, and she wanted to apologize but felt embarrassed. In the end, she chose to apologize. So, sorry, she whispered. I admit I was wrong. But before she finished speaking, she ran out crying. Chapter 15 Chapter 15 Ambiguity and Education A boy, in his early twenties after combining his two lifetimes, managed to make a little girl, the female protagonist, cry. That's quite an achievement. It's embarrassing for a man in his twenties after adding his two lives to make an eleven-year-old girl cry, and it's not something he can boast about. Although his physical age is only eleven, Alaric hasn't consciously realized it and hasn't lived as a child. Perhaps, before the age of seven, Alaric might have pretended in front of others, but as he grew older, he became more accustomed to handling things in his own way. In the eyes of others, this made him unusually mature for his age. Seeing the little girl crying and leaving the compartment, he sighed helplessly and chased after her. I always feel like he is so mature, Marietta said, watching Alaric's back. I feel the same way, Cho Chang nodded in agreement. Other boys of the same age only know how to sulk, they never take the initiative to admit mistakes and comfort girls. In the corridor, Hermione looked at the scenery speeding by outside the window, intentionally not turning around to let Alaric see her teary eyes. All right, don't be angry. Is it okay if I admit I was wrong? Alaric approached, habitually patting Hermione's fluffy head, just like he did with Himari. This time, it was as if he had stepped on a cat's tail. Hermione turned around angrily, coquettishly saying, Don't touch my hair. I'm not a little kid anymore. Her sudden turn almost made her collide with Alaric's face. Then, the first thing she saw was Alaric's ambiguous smile, and the distance between their cheeks was less than five centimeters. Hermione's face blushed again and she quickly turned her head. Why are you, following me, out? She whispered. Isn't it because I saw a little girl crying at the drop of a hat? I'm afraid her tears will flood the train, so I chased after her to stop her, Alaric replied. This sounded even more like teasing a child. I won't flood the train with my tears, Hermione refuted reflexively, then immediately realized that Alaric was teasing her. So, she angrily used her small fists to punch him twice. All right. Don't be sulky. Crying won't solve any problems, Alaric said, holding the hand that she had just used to punch him. This made Hermione's face even redder. She had never been treated like this by a boy, being touched on the head and holding hands. Unfortunately, Alaric not only lacked romantic experience but also had no intention of dating an eleven-year-old girl right now. In such a situation, he would naturally do things to disrupt the atmosphere. He began lecturing Hermione. In fact, Having different opinions is common in learning and research. When someone holds a different opinion from you, you shouldn't argue with them out of anger. Instead, carefully consider whether their point of view is reasonable and acceptable. If their view is more reasonable, we need to actively learn and incorporate it into our knowledge system. Conversely, we need to think about the flaws in their view and refute them. So, crying won't solve the problem. These words were like a teacher educating a student. The ambiguous atmosphere was immediately shattered, but Hermione was, after all, a unique little school tyrant. She vaguely nodded in understanding. However, she felt a bit uncomfortable in her heart, and for Alaric, she inexplicably harbored a bit of unreasonable dissatisfaction. If Cho Chang and Marietta were present, they would definitely say that they were two weirdos. Alaric, Hermione said very formally after listening. You are indeed a knowledgeable person and good at learning. After entering Hogwarts, can I consult you? Facing the serious request from her, Alaric happily replied, Of course, I'm happy to chat with such a cute girl like you. Sometimes, he indeed forgets his way of speaking and says things that can be misunderstood. Hearing such words, Hermione, who had just returned to normal, blushed again and hurriedly returned to the compartment. Inside the compartment, Cho Chang and Marietta, who were eavesdropping on the door, had initially placed their ears against the door, wanting to overhear what Alaric and Hermione were talking about in the corridor how Alaric would comfort Hermione, and what would happen. Unfortunately, Hermione had walked too far out when she first left, and the place where the two were chatting was far from the compartment door. As a result, Cho Chang and Marietta didn't hear anything. Now that Hermione had returned, blushing, they rushed back to their original positions. 
pretending to eat snacks and chat, they managed not to let Hermione and Alaric notice anything unusual. Dot. Dot. Chapter 16. Chapter 16. Hogwarts Castle and Professor McGonagall. Time passed quickly. In the blink of an eye, the sky had darkened, and the train was finally approaching Hogwarts Castle. Alaric happily chatted with the three girls the entire afternoon, and they became friends. Although he had never had a romantic relationship or many female friends before the transmigration, dealing with a few girls was no problem. As they packed their belongings and prepared to disembark, a commotion and fighting noises erupted outside the door. Alaric listened carefully and recognized the voices of Harry and Ron. Additionally, there was a distinctive arrogant voice, which must be Draco Malfoy. In Alaric's impression, Draco Malfoy wasn't a genuinely bad kid. Born into a sacred 28 Bullard wizard family, influenced by his parents and relatives who were Death Eaters, he developed a selfish and arrogant character, especially towards moles. However, due to Alaric being a mole himself, he naturally stood in opposition to Malfoy. So, even knowing Malfoy's true nature, Alaric didn't want to have much interaction with this Bullard wizard. After all, dealing with naughty kids was troublesome. Moreover, Alaric's current focus was on two things, researching magic and increasing his powers and building good friendships with Hermione. He planned to use the influence and changes on Hermione to verify his speculations and research on the plot. On the one hand, his energy was limited, and influencing one person was more convenient than three. On the other hand, compared to boys, he preferred interacting with cute girls. So, for now, he didn't intend to purposefully have much contact with Harry and Ron. He listened to the sounds outside the door, where Malfoy and his two lackeys, Crabbe and Goyle, were arguing with Harry and Ron. Then, a brawl ensued, and Malfoy was bitten by scabbers, after which both groups went their separate ways. Finally, after a long journey, the train sounded its whistle, and its speed gradually slowed down. In the night, the tall black shadow of Hogwarts loomed closer and closer. At last, they arrived at their destination, Alaric's long-awaited magical school. The students pushed and shoved, one after another, squeezing off the train. Taking advantage of his strength, Alaric led the three girls through the crowd, creating a bloody path. After getting off the train, they were greeted by a small platform, and a loud voice shouted, First year students, first year students, come over here. The owner of the voice specifically mentioned Harry Potter. Alaric knew this was Hagrid, the gamekeeper of Hogwarts. He quickly and casually said goodbye to the two second-year students, Cho Chang and Marietta, then took Hermione and headed toward the source of the sound. Being led by a boy like this made Hermione a bit uncomfortable, but she pretended to be calm and followed along. Hagrid, with his giant bloodline, had a towering figure that exceeded various basketball players, visible from afar. All the new students followed him, stumbling along a small path, approaching a magnificent view of the huge castle standing tall on the mountain slope, with turrets rising into the night sky and windows twinkling under the stars. Hagrid led the students to board small boats, each accommodating four people. After Alaric and Hermione boarded, Harry and Ron followed. Harry and Ron warmly greeted them. The fleet set off, and along the way, there was silence. Everyone quietly admired the breathtaking view of the colossal castle approaching as they sailed across the lake. Occasionally, a sigh could be heard. After passing through a stretch of ivy, the fleet entered a dark tunnel, seemingly entering the underground of the castle. Finally, they arrived at a place similar to an underground dock and then climbed up a path of broken stones and pebbles. The new students disembarked one after another, and Hagrid led them to a massive oak door. Finally, they stood in front of Hogwarts. Hagrid knocked on the oak door three times, and it opened immediately. At the door was a tall black-haired witch wearing an emerald green robe. She had a serious look on her face, and she looked very difficult to deal with. First year students, Professor McGonagall, Hagrid said. Thank you, Hagrid. I'll take it from here, Professor McGonagall nodded and led the new students further into the castle. Passing through the grand entrance hall, Professor McGonagall brought them to a small room at the other end of the great hall. Welcome to Hogwarts, she said. The start of term feast is about to begin, but before you take your seats in the dining hall, you'll be sorted into your houses. The sorting is a very important ceremony because, while you are here, your house will be something like your family within Hogwarts. You will have classes with the rest of your house, sleep in your house dormitory, and spend free time in your house common room. Afterwards, she briefly introduced the four houses, mentioned some guidelines, and then asked the new students to wait for a moment before she promptly left the room. Chapter 17 
Chapter 17, Sorting Hat Ceremony and Ghosts As soon as Professor McGonagall left, the crowd immediately became noisy. The new students excitedly chatted, speculating about the sorting process and which house they wanted to join. Do you think we can be sorted into Ravenclaw? Hermione nudged Alaric, feeling a bit uneasy. Although the girl was proud, she felt a bit anxious in the unfamiliar magical world. Of course, Alaric encouraged confidently, I heard that Hogwarts has a talking hat. When new students put it on, it can determine the suitable house based on their personality traits. But what if my personality doesn't fit Ravenclaw? Hermione became even more anxious upon hearing this. In the original story, the sorting hat initially considered Hermione suitable for both Gryffindor and Ravenclaw but ultimately chose Gryffindor. In other words, Hermione is suitable for Ravenclaw. But in order to prevent any mishaps from happening, Alaric reminded her of the method to influence the sorting hat's decision. Didn't I tell you? I heard about a method. Strong desires can change the sorting hat's opinion. As long as you strongly express the desire to join a particular house, the sorting hat will take your opinion into consideration. Hermione nodded, feeling a bit reassured. However, Ron chimed in with his opinion, why join Ravenclaw? Trust me, Gryffindor is the best house. His loud voice immediately attracted the attention of the surrounding new students, and he found himself overwhelmed by various responses. Some students vehemently disagreed, stating that Slytherin was the best house, while others were advocating for Ravenclaw. On the other hand, some wizard kids who favoured Gryffindor loudly supported Ron. The scene became as noisy as a marketplace. Taking Hermione away from the centre of the commotion, Alaric comforted her. Don't listen to fools, you might catch their foolishness. His words amused Hermione, easing some of her inattention. The commotion continued for quite some time but suddenly, the noise turned into high-pitched screams. Screams akin to a horror movie scene attracted the attention of Alaric and Hermione. They turned to see Hermione's smiling face immediately vanish, replaced by her open mouth, nearly screaming. This was not just like a horror movie scene, it was an actual horror movie scene. About twenty ghosts suddenly appeared on the wall. These pearly white, semi-transparent ghosts slid across the room, talking to each other and paying little attention to the first-year students. They seemed to be arguing about something. Compared to the startled new students, Alaric was much calmer. Instead, he was interested in the physical state of these ghosts. Throughout various magical worldviews, only the ghosts in Harry Potter had normal intelligence and were not influenced by negative emotions. Apart from being able to touch and affect tangible matter, differentiating them from humans, they had thought patterns similar to ordinary people. They even had their own society. In contrast, ghosts in other worlds were either of low intelligence, lacked thinking abilities, harbored hatred with thought patterns vastly different from humans, or desired reincarnation and had no attachment to reality, lacking strong emotions. Regrettably, Alaric currently lacked the ability and sufficient knowledge to study ghosts. However, he was determined to thoroughly study these ghosts one day in the future. Now, he could only comfort the nervous Hermione in a low voice. Most girls were always afraid of things like ghosts. Then, they heard the ghosts talking with the new students. Freshmen, oh. I suppose you're ready for the test? Fat Friar smiled at them. Some students silently nodded. I hope you get into Hufflepuff. The Friar said. I used to attend that house. Now, move forward. A thin voice said. The sorting ceremony is about to begin. Professor McGonagall returned, and the ghosts floated away, disappearing through the opposite wall. Now, line up, Professor McGonagall told the first year students, follow me. Following the crowd, Alaric passed through a double door and arrived at a luxurious dining hall. They never imagined such a magical, magnificent place. Students from other houses were already seated at four long tables, and above the tables, thousands of floating candles illuminated the dining hall. The four tables were adorned with glittering gold plates and tall wine glasses. At the head of the hall, there was another long table for the teachers. Professor McGonagall led the first-year students to the other side, asking them to face the senior students in the row, with the teachers behind them. Dot. Chapter 18, Chapter 18, Sorting Hat in the grand hall, candlelight flickered, and hundreds of faces staring at them resembled pale lanterns. Ghosts mingled among the students, emitting a faint silvery glow. Looking up, they could see the velvety black ceiling adorned with twinkling starlight. Alaric heard Hermione whisper, The ceiling here has been enchanted and it looks like the sky outside. I read about it in Hogwarts. 
a history of the school. It was hard to believe that there was a ceiling up there, and it was equally difficult to believe that the dining hall was not open to the sky. Professor McGonagall placed a four-legged stool in front of the first-year students, placing an old and dirty pointy wizard hat on it. Alaric knew this legendary hat well, it was the sorting hat. He began to look forward to the classic scene, the sorting hat singing its annual song that changed every year. Next, the hat started to move. A wide seam appeared around the brim, forming a mouth-like opening. The hat began to sing. Oh, you may not think I'm pretty. But don't judge on what you see. I leap myself if you can find. A smarter hat than me. You can keep your bowlers black. Your top's hat's sleek and tall. For I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat. And I can cap them all. There's nothing hidden in your head. The sorting hat can't see. So try me on and I will tell you. Where you ought to be. You might belong in Gryffindor. Where dwell brave of heart. Their daring, nerve, and chivalry. Set Gryffindors apart. You might belong in Hufflepuff. Where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true. And unafraid of toil. Or yet wise old Ravenclaw. If you've a ready mind. Where those of wit and learning. Will always find their kind. Or perhaps in Slytherin. You'll make your real friends. Those cunning folk use any means. To achieve their ends. So put me on. Don't be afraid. And you won't get in a flap. You're safe in my hands though I have none. For I'm a thinking cap. The song lasted for about five minutes. And after the sorting hat finished singing. The whole hall erupted into applause. However, Alaric felt that the applause was somewhat insincere, the strange song didn't seem to resonate well with the audience. The sorting hat bowed to the four tables in turn, and then it stopped moving. The formal sorting ceremony began. Professor McGonagall walked a few steps forward, holding a roll of parchment in her hands. I will call out your names, and you will put on the hat, sit on the stool, and await your sorting, she explained. Hannah Abbott a rosy-cheeked girl with two golden braids stepped forward. Alaric remembered from the original story that she later married Neville Longbottom. She stumbled out of the line, put on the hat, which conveniently covered her eyes, and after a brief pause, Hufflepuff, the hat announced. Applause and cheers erupted from the right table as Hannah Abbott took her seat. Susan Bones, Hufflepuff, the hat declared again. Susan quickly joined Hannah. Terry Boot, Ravenclaw, the sorting continued. Hermione Granger. After a few names, it was Hermione's turn. She practically ran to the stool, looking back anxiously. Alaric smiled, nodded at her, and she felt a bit relieved. She quickly placed the hat on her head. This time, instead of immediately announcing the house, the sorting hat seemed to hesitate for two or three seconds before reluctantly declaring, Ravenclaw. Alaric applauded excitedly. Not only was he happy that Hermione was sorted into Ravenclaw, but it also indicated that the plot was not unchangeable and might suggest that the destiny represented by the plot may not even exist. The students at the second table on the left cheered and clapped. Cho Chang and Marietta stood up to welcome Hermione into their group. The sorting hat continued to call names, and the crowd gradually diminished. When it was Neville's turn, the boy ran to Gryffindor with his hat on, completely forgetting to take it off, which caused quite a joke. Finally, Alaric. This name attracted the attention of the wizard kids. Alaric walked out confidently, drawing the gaze of the students, especially the girls, who marveled at his handsome appearance and the stylish mages' association uniform, different from the plain and dark cloaks of other wizard kids. Among them, it caused countless exclamations and discussions. The boys wanted to know where such a beautiful cloak came from, while the girls wanted to know who such a handsome guy was. Alaric held the sorting hat in his hands, feeling its slimy texture, realizing how dirty it was. Combined with the unpleasant smell emanating from it, he felt as if he were holding a rotting orange. He wanted to throw it out immediately. Suppressing his disgust, Alaric put on the sorting hat. As soon as it touched his head, the hat exclaimed loudly, startling everyone at Hogwarts. This is strange. It's the first time I can't see a newcomer's thoughts. The hat's voice echoed in Alaric's mind. In your mind, I only see a world of chaos and constant change. What have you done? I don't know either, Alaric replied playfully in his mind. But he realized that the experiences and training in the time tunnel had not only granted him unlimited progress in his abilities and natural talent for time and space but also a tough and impenetrable soul. The sorting hat seemed to be at a loss for words, hesitating for two or three seconds before reluctantly uttering, Ravenclaw. 
Alaric, feeling excited, clapped his hands. Not only was he pleased that he had successfully conveyed the idea of Ravenclaw to the Sorting Hat, but he also felt a sense of liberation, a belief that the plot could be altered and that the so-called fate might not be absolute. The wizard kids at the second table on the left applauded as Alaric confidently walked toward them. Dot. Chapter 19, Chapter 19, Start of Term Feast. Unable to read Alaric's thoughts, the sorting hat couldn't make a judgment about him. After hesitating for a while, it finally yielded to Professor McGonagall's urging. Well, well, I'll make an exception this time. It's up to you to decide where you want to go boy. Which house do you choose? Ravenclaw, Alaric replied. Ravenclaw? The sorting hat shouted loudly. Then, it left a parting message in his mind, I will remember you, child. Most Ravenclaw students were girls. When they saw such a handsome guy sorted into Ravenclaw, they erupted in joyful cheers, warmly welcoming Alaric. Alaric sat among the girls, politely dealing with their enthusiasm. Most of them wanted to get to know him, and the older students, especially the girls, were eager for a romantic date with him. Alaric had to gracefully decline one after another. During this time, he overheard Hermione and Cho Chang complaining, shameless. Others inquired about the source of his cloak, and Alaric introduced his design and Madame Malkin's shop to them, earning admiration and praise. This was his first time facing so many girls at once. If it were in his previous life during college, he would have been too nervous to speak. Now, however, he could handle it with ease. Of course, dealing with college girls was much more challenging than dealing with the girls at Hogwarts. The last one to cause a stir during the sorting was, of course, Harry Potter. Everyone wanted to see the boy who survived a deadly encounter with Voldemort. When he was sorted into Gryffindor, cheers erupted from the table. The Weasley twins shouted, We've got Potter. We've got Potter. Even the Gryffindor ghost welcomed him. The last three students were sorted. Lisa Turpin became a Ravenclaw. Ron Weasley was sorted into Gryffindor. Blaise Zarbini was sorted into Slytherin. Dumbledore stood up, looking at the students with a smile, spreading his arms wide. It seemed that nothing made him happier than seeing the students gathered. Welcome, he said. Welcome to a new year at Hogwarts. Before we begin our banquet, I would like to say a few words. And here they are, Nitwit, Blubber, Oddment, Tweak, thank you. He sat back down. Everyone applauded and cheered. However, in reality, all the young wizards were puzzled by his last words. What does that sentence mean? Hermione frowned. Never mind that, Cho Chang replied. Dumbledore is a great wizard, just a bit crazy. He's not crazy, Alaric interjected. Read those words backward in Latin, and it's I am up to no good. You know Latin too? Hermione was extremely surprised, even dropping her pumpkin pie without noticing. Yes, the day after I decided to go to Hogwarts, I started learning Latin, Alaric replied while enjoying a plate of roasted lamb in front of him. I also studied ancient Celtic and Old Norse, which are historically significant and have a mythological flavor. I thought learning magic might require them, and it turns out I was right. Old Celtic and Old Norse too. I don't even know what they are. The girls were amazed at his genius and erudition, especially Hermione. As a fellow top student, she genuinely admired Alaric, feeling defeated in the face of such a prodigy. Next was the time to eat. Alaric thoroughly enjoyed the delicious food at Hogwarts, despite the universally known fact of British cuisine. Although it was well known to the world, the wizarding world in Britain is completely different from the mole world. He is overwhelmed by these delicacies. Aside from being a bit too sweet, he found every dish praiseworthy. If I were from the modern world, I would love them even more, was Alaric's final evaluation. However, even Cho Chang didn't catch the meaning. After everyone had their fill, Dumbledore casually waved his wand, and instantly, all the dishes disappeared. He stood up, and the hall returned to silence. Oh, now that everyone is full and had enough to drink, I have a few more things to say. First year students, be aware that the Forbidden Forest on the campus is strictly off limits. Some older students should also take note of this. Also, Mr. Filch, the caretaker, has reminded me to tell you not to use magic in the corridors during breaks. The Quidditch tryouts will be held in the second week of this semester. Those who want to join their house teams, please contact Madame Hooch. Lastly, I must inform you all that anyone who doesn't wish to encounter accidents, painful deaths, please do not enter the corridor on the third floor to the right. The new students were in discussion, and even Hermione was asking Cho Chang for explanations.
but even Cho Chang found the last rule inexplicable, claiming it was newly added this semester. Only Elric knew that the biggest surprise of the school year would come from that corridor. However, judging by the lively discussions among the students, legends like Hogwarts' Seven Wonders were popular both in both worlds. Dot. Chapter 20 Chapter 20 School Song and Common Room Extra Chapter When the discussions of the young wizard subsided, Dumbledore made the next decision. Now, before you all go to bed, let's sing the school song together, Dumbledore announced loudly. The smiles on the faces of the other teachers seemed to freeze. Dumbledore gently flicked his wand, and a long, golden ribbon floated out of it. The ribbon twisted and turned in the air above the high tables like a snake, forming lines of text. Alaric could see that these were the lyrics of the Hogwarts school song. Choose your preferred tune, Dumbledore said. Ready, sing. The entire student body and faculty burst into song. The sound was extremely unpleasant. Himari, who was sleeping soundly in the backpack, was awakened by the chorus, covering her ears and meowing in protest. Everyone finished singing the school song in a disorganized manner. Only the Weasley twins continued singing, following the slow melody of the funeral march. Dumbledore conducted the last few bars for them, and when they finished, his applause was the loudest. R. Music. He wiped his eyes, saying, more magical than anything we do here. Now it's bedtime. Off you go to your dormitories. The new students followed their house prefects out of the Great Hall, through various corridors. Alaric recognized the Ravenclaw female prefect. Her name was Penelope Clearwater, with long, curly brown hair. Her beautiful appearance exuded elegance and intellect. For Alaric, her charm far surpassed Hermione and Cho Chang, who were still young. He was particularly interested in this girl who played a minor role in the original work but frequently appeared in fan fiction. Accompanied by another male prefect, they led the eaglets to the tower on the west side of the castle, the top of the Ravenclaw Tower. In front of a worn-out wooden board, there was a bronze door knocker shaped like an eagle. Unlike other houses, Ravenclaw's common room doesn't have a password. You need to answer the door knocker's question and be recognized to enter, Penelope explained. She knocked on the door, and the eagle's beak immediately opened. Instead of a bird's cry, a gentle, musical voice spoke. What will you break once you say it? So, who would like to give it a try? She looked expectantly at the new students, especially giving Alaric a few more glances. Although Penelope valued intellect more, she couldn't deny that she had a high initial favorability toward him due to his charming appearance. Facing the expectant gaze of the female prefect, Alaric gladly stepped forward. Silence, he answered. Nicely done, the eagle-shaped door knocker praised, and the door swung open. This was just a riddle game. Alaric was a bit speechless. Wasn't this door's question too easy to crack? However, in reality, due to the lack of proper basic education, most young wizards lacked logical reasoning skills. For clever Ravenclaws, riddles were often safer than passwords. Penelope nodded appreciatively at Alaric, and her favorability toward him increased significantly. This was because he not only had a charming appearance but also demonstrated intelligence. She then introduced the new students. Congratulations. I am Prefect Penelope Clearwater. I'm delighted to welcome you to Ravenclaw House. Our emblem is an eagle soaring high above the unattainable peak. Our colors are sky blue and bronze. She went on to elaborate on Ravenclaw's achievements, characteristics, evaluations of other houses, and finally mentioned the house ghost, the Grey Lady, Ravenclaw's daughter. She would provide assistance to Ravenclaw students. The Ravenclaw common room was a large, circular room with elegant arched windows on the walls, adorned with blue and bronze silk. Ravenclaw students could see the beautiful scenery outside through the windows. The ceiling was a dome decorated with stars, and the deep blue carpet beneath also had stars. There were tables, chairs, and bookshelves in the room. In a niche opposite the door was a marble bust of Rowena Ravenclaw, and the door next to it led to the dormitories above. The two prefects brought the new students to their dormitory. The dormitory was a four-person room with four beds, each with four canopy pillows, and hanging above were burgundy velvet canopies. Alaric opened his suitcase, tidied up his belongings a bit, and then placed Himari at the head of his bed. In the evening, Himari seemed energetic, rolling around on the velvet bedspread. The names of the three roommates were Anthony Goldstein, a blonde Jewish boy, Terry Boot, with brown hair, and Michael Corner, with black hair. They were supporting characters with names and plot lines in the original work. They, Alaric, and his two other dorm mates, Kevin and Twistle and Stephen Cornfoot, made up the only six boys in the Ravenclaw new intake. They couldn't even fill two dormitories. 
but in fact, Ravenclaw had always had more female students, so in terms of the number of male students, this year's intake already exceeded previous years. After exchanging brief greetings with their new roommates, everyone changed into their pajamas and lay down to sleep. The journey to the school was indeed exhausting. Dot. Chapter 21, Chapter 21, Summoning and Oriana. Alaric sat on the soft bed, holding the little cat, reading a book while lost in thought. It had been eleven years since he arrived in this world, transforming from an ordinary person into a wizard venturing into the mysteries of magic. The mysterious gates were about to open for him. Starting tomorrow, he could study the secrets of magic in this castle and explore the true nature of the world. Even with the soul of a reincarnator, he found himself too excited to sleep. He waited until all three roommates were asleep before getting up and approaching the fireplace. Himari was curious too and followed him. She also remembered the monthly summoning that her master would perform. This was an ability Alaric awakened at the age of six. As his sense of time and space continued to improve, he often felt a throbbing sensation in his heart. Then, when he turned six, he finally had enough mental strength to respond to that throbbing sensation, communicate with another world, and perform summoning. However, most of the time, his summonings were in vain. Occasionally, the things he could summon were just common items like food, sand, or daily necessities. Fortunately, he sometimes managed to get some specialties from the other world. Some of these specialties even came with unique powers, such as the Duran's Ring, Konoa Forehead Protector, and other items. Most of these were limited to that, and summoning Himari was just an extremely lucky incident. This time, his luck seemed to be in play again. Silently, a crack opened in the void, and without further ado, it released a large object. It was a steampunk-style metal sphere, about a meter in diameter. When it fell to the ground, it made a muffled sound, indicating its considerable weight. Alaric reached out to touch it, but before he could react, the sphere opened on its own. Just like a lotus unfolding its petals, the shell of the sphere opened neatly, revealing everything it contained. Curled up inside was a beautiful girl whose entire body was made up of gears and clockwork. She had golden hair and a silver shell, or was it skin? A massive winding key was inserted into her back. Even without reading the information that came with the summoning, just from her appearance, Alaric could tell who she was. Valoran Continent, the Lady of Clockwork, Oriana. The origin of the clockwork maiden Oriana had two explanations provided by Riot Games. According to the first, the creator of the clockwork lady created this robot in memory of his daughter Oriana, who accidentally passed away. In the second explanation, Oriana was once a girl with flesh and blood. However, an accident in the lower levels of Zorn indirectly caused her to contract a severe illness. Her body, gradually deteriorating, had to be replaced with precise artificial organs, one after another until there was no human flesh left in her. Oriana herself was proficient in precise mechanical manufacturing. Her mechanical heart and the ball-shaped puppet were all crafted by her own hands. According to the so-called scientists in Valoran, their version of science was quite different from Earth's science. It was a unique blend of magic and technology that they referred to as Hextech. In other words, Oriana's proficiency in precise mechanical manufacturing included some knowledge of Valoran's magic. The collision of magic between Valoran and the wizarding world of Harry Potter? It was indeed an interesting idea, but the current priority was to understand Oriana's situation. However, how could he awaken or rather, activate, the mechanical girl in front of him? After pondering for a while, Alaric finally came up with the most obvious solution, wind up the key. What was the significance of the giant winding key behind Oriana? Perhaps, it was also a way to initiate Oriana. He walked behind Oriana and tried to turn her winding key. Turning the key was even simpler than he had imagined. Alaric only exerted a little force, and it could be easily turned. As the shaft turned, it emitted the sounds of springs and gears. However, it quickly quieted down, just like a machine that had been idle for a long time and became smooth after being restarted. Only the sensation of turning the key constantly reminded Alaric that he was facing a mechanical creation. After Alaric turned the key counterclockwise three and a half times, it reached its limit. When he let go, the key began to rotate steadily and slowly clockwise. With this rhythmic rotation, Alaric could feel a spiritual throb, a soul awakening within the mechanical body before him. It established a contract-like connection with his own soul. This feeling also occurred when he summoned Himari. This was probably his summoning technique, signing a contract between the summoning and the summoner after summoning a creature. 
he could feel himself taking the lead in the contract, unveiling the secrets of the souls of both Oriana and Himari. As the key continued to rotate, the magical glow began to emanate from the intricate patterns on Oriana's mechanical body. Alaric turned to look at his three roommates. They remained undisturbed and were sleeping peacefully. After about a minute, the glow gradually dissipated. Following that, Oriana suddenly opened her eyes. The crystal, or rather, crystal crafted, eyes emitted a golden light. Curling up, she sat on the ground, hiding her little face behind her knees. Only her sparkling eyes stared at Ulrich, revealing an emotion that no machine should possess. Dot chapter 22, chapter 22, the Lady of Clockwork and Shrinking Charm. At this moment, she gazed at Ulrich, and Ulrich gazed back at her. Their eyes met. Hello, Oriana. Ulrich reached out his hand to her. Hello, Daddy. I'm so glad to see you. Oriana happily took Ulrich's hand and stood up. Her voice was very pleasant, but her pronunciation was a typical mechanical style and her tone was not even as human-like as an AI assistant like Siri. However, Alaric could sense emotions in her voice that surpassed what beings like Siri could express, human emotions. Her hand was cold but had a warm texture, covered with delicate patterns. When he pulled her up, Alaric felt a bit of strain. After all, she was an all-metal mechanical body, and he estimated that she weighed around 100 kilograms. Standing up, Oriana held the metal hem of her skirt with both hands, elegantly performing a standard curtsy to Ulrik. Then, with a wave of her right hand, the metal shell that served as packaging immediately closed and folded into a half-meter diameter metal ball on the ground. The gears on the surface of the ball started running, and silver-blue light emerged from the embedded crystals. It then smoothly floated up. So, this was her puppet. The clockwork lady, Oriana, finally unfolded completely before him. Seeing this, Alaric could finally ask the question that had been lingering in his mind. Oriana, why do you call me Daddy? However, he did not get the answer he expected. Daddy is Dad. That was her answer. Next, Alaric inquired about her abilities. Oriana, being obedient, answered all questions, giving Alaric a general understanding of her. Oriana did indeed possess human-level intelligence. However, since her thought core was based on Hextech and Soul technology, it formed personality rather than computation. Thus, she didn't have the computational power like a regular computer. This was the difference between Hextech and scientific technology. Both had intelligent cores, but the former excelled in spirituality and soul, while the latter excelled in computational speed. However, Alaric believed that this could be upgraded. By using magic to simulate electronic technology, manufacturing a CPU, and unifying the language for programming both the CPU and the thought core, Oriana could have another brain as a Hextech CPU. This way, the thought core could focus on personality and emotions, while the CPU focused on computation. Oriana could become a super-artificial intelligence with human thought patterns and the logical and computational abilities of a supercomputer. Regarding her knowledge, Oriana behaved like a patient with amnesia. Having a complete blank in her memories of past experiences but possessing sufficient common sense about life. Furthermore, she was indeed highly skilled in the precise mechanical manufacturing of Hextech. Although Oriana was a long range hero in League of Legends, in reality, Oriana had considerable close quarters combat capabilities. Her metal shell was sturdier than Alaric had imagined. Conventional physical attacks at the level of missiles couldn't budge her metal shell. Moreover, she had strong resistance to magic. Powered by the Hextech Crystal Heart, she also had substantial power, with a maximum output reaching several tons or even tens of tons. In addition, she could launch magical missiles from her palm, a functionality similar to Oriana's basic attack in the game. She possessed an anti-gravity system to maintain her suspension. At maximum output, it was equivalent to flying, although the speed couldn't exceed the speed of sound. Most importantly, as a mechanical being, she could continue to upgrade herself. With advanced technology, she could become infinitely stronger, whether it was strengthening her strength, attaching various weapons externally, or increasing her speed. However, the most powerful ability of the Lady of Clockwork wasn't within herself but in her ball-shaped mechanical sphere. All of Oriana's spells revolved around that. It was an autonomous mechanical body with a certain level of intelligence. It would follow Oriana and assist her. Oriana could give it special commands, making it unleash magical effects such as Command, Dissonance, Command, Attack, Command, Protect, and Command, Shockwave, which were the four most typical commands. In fact, it could do much more. After learning about Oriana, Alaric felt pleasantly surprised and excited. 
The seemingly frail and stiff mechanical girl in front of him was indeed powerful enough. In the world of Harry Potter, most of the time, she would be sufficient to protect the not yet powerful Alaric. Even facing Voldemort and Dumbledore at their peak, she had enough ability to escape with him. However, he still faced a significant problem, how to hide Oriana and her puppet. A girl who was 1.62 meters tall and a metal ball with a half meter diameter couldn't possibly be hidden from the eyes of his classmates and Dumbledore forever. But how could he explain Oriana's existence to others? Finally, Alaric barely came up with a solution, the shrinking spell. This was the first spell he learned and currently the one he was most proficient at. He planned to use the shrinking spell to shrink Oriana down to the size of a figurine, so he could carry her around like a toy. In his opinion, since the wizard's chess set in this world was alive, pulling out a moving figurine wouldn't be a big deal. The only problem was that the shrinking spell didn't work on living beings. For mechanical life like Oriana, he didn't know what the effect would be. Well, let's give it a try. Alaric took out his wand and gently tapped Oriana. Reducio. Fortunately, the shrinking spell worked on mechanical life, and Oriana successfully shrank to the size of his palm. Her puppet also turned into a tiny metal ball. Oriana happily climbed up Alaric's arm when he held her up. She then jumped onto Himari, riding on her and having a great time. Feeling the same contract between Oriana and Alaric, Himari also played happily with her until Alaric grabbed her by the neck and lifted them both onto the bed. Before going to sleep, Alaric asked a quiet question. Oriana, what is your wish after coming to this world? I want to be with my dad forever and then take a good look at the world. Chapter 23, Chapter 23, Heartthrob and Studious. In reality, Oriana's appearance caused quite a stir, contrary to what Alaric had imagined. As a figurine doll, she was too exquisite and beautiful. Alaric's three roommates all wanted to take a closer look at her. Michael Corner even wanted to hold her and examine her, but he was promptly refused without hesitation. Oriana shyly crawled under Alaric's cloak, slipped into the pocket of his robe, only revealing her head to observe secretly. Since then, Alaric became the most popular student in Ravenclaw, both among boys and girls. Boys lined up, eager to see Oriana with their own eyes, while girls were drawn in by his appearance and the cute Imari. In the Ravenclaw common room and at the dining table, there were always people crowded around him, chattering incessantly and causing him annoyance. However, there were exceptions, Hermione mostly stuck with him, claiming they were studying together. Cho Chang always shuttled back and forth between her original friend group and him, but these two girls didn't make him feel irritated. Then there was a beautiful senior prefect, Penelope Clearwater, who didn't join the crowd watching him. Although she didn't hide her affection for him, she never did anything to make him uncomfortable. Due to persistent harassment, Alara often wore a cold expression to discourage strangers from approaching him. The result was that, in the eyes of most people, he was molded into an aloof image. Boys and girls gradually stopped approaching him, but to Alaric's dismay, his popularity among girls continued to rise. These girls even called him Prince Charming and Heartthrob. Whether they had Stockholm Syndrome or were masochistic, he didn't know. Among the boys, only his three roommates had truly become friends with him so far. Especially after learning that he was a Melbourne orphan from an orphanage, Slytherin boys began to consciously reject him. You're just a superficial mudblood. Draco Malfoy once commented on him like this in front of him. The result was that in the entire break he was hit by the Levicopus spell and hung upside down on the corridor ceiling until Professor Snape, who rushed over after hearing the news, saved him before the class. As a result, Ravenclaw lost 10 points, but no one blamed Alaric. Gryffindor students even developed a higher opinion of him. For Alaric, these welcomes or resistances were meaningless. His main goals were studying plots and learning magic. In fact, for the professors, Alaric was undoubtedly an excellent student. He could perfectly complete the tasks assigned by the teachers in transfiguration, charms, and potions. No classroom question could trouble him. Of course, there was the famous know-it-all Miss Granger. This pair of inseparable study nerds was loved by the professors, and Ravenclaw's house points were skyrocketing. They were also regulars at Madame Pince's library. After class, the two of them always went to the library to continue studying, and Cho Chang also joined them, studying together until finishing their homework. For Alaric, this kind of studying reminded him of his high school days, making him feel somewhat nostalgic. He had always been a person who could endure studying, and when the content wasn't the somewhat dull high school curriculum but interesting magic, he wished he could spend all his time on it. Even Hermione felt inferior to this level of enthusiasm. 
Coupled with his innate talent for learning, Alaric's learning progress soon reached the level of higher grades. However, his learning process was not without obstacles. In his opinion, the writing of technical and academic books in the magical world was quite unreasonable. All the authors wrote quite casually, they would use large sections of gorgeous but useless rhetoric, often interspersed with extensive psychological descriptions and records of their own actions. This made the reader feel like they were not reading a magic book but the author's autobiographical novel. Moreover, the masters in the magical world were quite arbitrary in their choice of technical terms. In their academic circle, there was no term like scientific name. Most academic terms were based on conventional usage. For the same magic, different authors described it in completely different ways, and quite arbitrarily at that, often leaving readers bewildered. They also didn't have terms like professional names or academic language. As a result, Alaric often had to spend a considerable amount of time after reading a book organizing the knowledge, removing 80% of useless rhetoric and stream of consciousness, and comparing with other books to eliminate possible repetitions. Since it was common to find two books mentioning the same spell but using different names and descriptions. Then, he would use more professional and concise words to record his findings. In less than a week since the start of school, he had already filled half of a notebook. He believed that his notes, created by constructing his own system of professional vocabulary and recording it using academic paper style, were more concise and effective than these magical books. He estimated that by the time he achieved his goal of reading all the books in the Ravenclaw Common Room and Hogwarts Library within the seven years of school, his recorded notes would be enough to encompass the vast majority of the magical world's knowledge. Dot. Chapter 24, Chapter 24, Anecdotes and Flying Class Extra Chapter In Alaric's size, all the professors at Hogwarts were undoubtedly highly accomplished. Even Severus Snape, with his gloomy and awkward demeanor, was still deserving of being a master in potions, in Alaric's opinion. The only two classes he found difficult were history of magic and defense against the dark arts. Alaric felt that the history of magic class was not very useful for him. Remembering the time of the Goblin Rebellions and the establishment of magical laws seemed meaningless. As for the defense against the dark arts class, Professor Quirrell was not only foolish but also sinister. Alaric couldn't learn anything useful from him. So, whenever these two classes came around, he would discreetly skip them and hide in the library. Professor Binns, the history of magic teacher, was completely unaware of this. The ghost, who had lived for almost a thousand years, had very limited knowledge of the students. He had never even correctly called a student's name. As for Professor Quirrell, he dared to be angry but dared not speak. He was a weak-willed person with Voldemort living on the back of his head, making him paranoid and fearful all the time. Apart from studying, other aspects of life at Hogwarts were quite interesting, such as the moving staircases. There were a total of 142 of them. Some were wide and big, others were narrow and shaky. Some changed directions every Friday, and some went only halfway, with a step disappearing suddenly, forcing you to remember where to jump. Moreover, there were many doors that won't open unless you asked them politely or poked them in the right place. Some doors were not real doors at all, just solid walls that looked like doors. Remembering where everything was not easy because everything seemed to be constantly moving. People in the portraits also visited each other constantly, and even suits of armor could walk. For Lyric, experiencing these moving staircases in person was entirely different from watching them in movies or reading about them in books. These supposedly fascinating moving staircases, which were portrayed as interesting in movies and books, brought him a lot of trouble in his daily activities. He felt that anyone with even a slight sense of direction would get lost in Hogwarts. The people in the portraits didn't bother him much, but as a polite person, greeting the portraits frequently became a tiresome task. However, Argus Filch, the caretaker, and his cat Mrs. Norris, who frightened most young wizards in the original work, didn't cause him much trouble. On the one hand, it was because he didn't cause any trouble, and on the other hand, Himari's presence made Mrs. Norris always kept her distance from Alaric. As a cat demon, Himari was like a big sister among all the cats at Hogwarts. All cats, even those with a squib lineage, listened to her. When Alaric was in class or at the library, Himari would sometimes wander around the castle by herself, and no one would harm her. Students liked her, and even the mischievous twins George and Fred Weasley respected her. Peeves, who was notorious for pranks, instinctively stayed away from her, probably because she was a cat demon. 
As a result, people often saw a white cat leading a group of cats of various sizes and colors parading around the castle, becoming a new wonder at Hogwarts. Sometimes, even Oriana would ride on Himari and stroll around with her. Apart from all these, there was one thing at Hogwarts that Alaric paid special attention to. It was something he both looked forward to and felt conflicted about, broomstick flying. In fact, Alaric was looking forward to Professor Hooch's flying class. After all, flying had been a dream of humanity for a long time. He himself always imagined soaring freely in the sky. Given his current level of magical ability, flying was still an unrealistic dream for him, also because the Harry Potter world itself did not have direct flying magic. But right now, there was a shortcut to achieving this goal, flying broomsticks. For Alaric, flying was cool, but riding a broomstick was too silly. Flying on a surfboard was cool, but riding a flying broomstick was silly. That was his point of view. However, Hermione didn't think so. Perhaps because as a Melbourne she had never even tried it, but for Alaric who had seen it in movies felt that riding a flying broomstick was a little funny. Since the news of Neville breaking his leg during the flying class had spread to Ravenclaw, Miss Know-It-All became even more nervous about the upcoming flying class. In the library, she borrowed a book called Quidditch Through the Ages and read it carefully several times. In her spare time, she kept muttering some flying guidance from this book and repeatedly asked Cho Chang, who had excellent flying skills, to describe the feeling of riding a broomstick. Even the easy-going Cho Chang was annoyed by her constant questions. Other young wizards were also somewhat uneasy. As the flying class approached, more and more students started discussing flying and Quidditch. Among the new students, those from wizarding families would boast about how they played games on broomsticks during the holidays, and Melbourne students could only envy them. Dot. Chapter 25, Chapter 25, Flying, Flying. Merry Christmas everyone, wish you all have a great day. Finally, Alaric's first flying class began. In this flying class, Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff students attended together, totaling about 30 to 40 new students. The lesson took place on a flat lawn, with the edge of the lawn leading to the forbidden forest. In the distance, black trees swayed in the wind. Before they arrived, the area had neatly arranged about forty broomsticks. Alaric had heard Cho Chang complain that the broomsticks at Hogwarts were too old, and most of them had some issues. Some shook uncontrollably when flying too high, while others had the bad habit of veering left or right during flight. Soon, their teacher, Professor Hooch, arrived. She had short grey hair and yellow eyes, resembling those of an eagle. All right, what are you all waiting for? She said sternly. Everyone stands next to a broomstick. Quickly, quickly, don't waste time. Alaric, in the middle of the line, reluctantly picked up a crooked and twisted old broomstick, its twigs sticking out haphazardly. Hermione stood next to him, curiously holding a broomstick that was almost completely bald, examining it closely. Stick your right hand and place it above the broomstick handle, Professor Hooch shouted, then say, up. Up. Everyone shouted along. Alaric didn't join the shout, he simply muttered it silently in his mind. However, the broomstick obediently moved into his hands. Muttering this kind of simple instruction, which wasn't even considered a spell, was no challenge for him. But for the young wizards, only a very few could do it. Hermione's broomstick just rolled on the ground, and some broomsticks didn't move at all. None of his three roommates succeeded. Terry and Anthony's broomsticks got entangled, while Michael's broomstick hit him in the face with its handle. There was chaos for a while before they moved on to the next step. Professor Hooch demonstrated how to mount a broomstick without sliding off. She walked among them, correcting their hand grips. All right, when I blow the whistle, both legs push off the ground, and you'll leave the ground. Push hard, Professor Hooch said. She even mentioned Neville as an example, his movements weren't standard, too impatient in pushing off, resulting in losing control and flying into the forbidden forest, breaking his wrist. Hold the broomstick steady, rise a few feet, then lean slightly forward, and descend vertically to the ground. Listen to my whistle, three, two, one. The next scene was another mess. Many people hadn't flown half a meter before falling to the ground. Hermione barely managed to stabilize her broomstick and took a minute to hover in the air. Perhaps because Padma Patil was of Indian descent, her broomstick performed dance in the air, and many young wizards looked at her with envy. But Dilaruk clearly saw her face turning pale, and her hands tightly gripping the broomstick. This acrobatics probably wasn't what she intended. 
Justin Finch Fletchley's broomstick kept spinning in place until Justin, dizzy, fell to the ground. Among them, Alaric was the best flyer. He effortlessly flew into the air. What kind of feeling was that? The air rushed through his hair, his robe fluttered behind him, and everyone seemed even smaller in his eyes. Hogwarts gradually looked complete from a bird's eye view. He could hear the sounds coming from the ground, the screams of the girls, the envious shouts of Terry and others. As he continued to ascend and accelerate, even the sounds seemed to be left behind. In fact, with his consistent daily exercise, his body had been steadily evolving and becoming stronger. Now, his physical fitness, balance, and reflexes far exceeded human limits, allowing him to control the flying broomstick effortlessly and perform many difficult maneuvers. He was riding the broomstick, shuttling through the Hogwarts sky. He dived through bridge arches, circled around towers several times, and could even do some rolls during the dives. The rapid flight deeply stimulated his nerves, and adrenaline made his blood boil. In the past, he had always been steady and calm. Even in his previous life, he hadn't done anything too outrageous. But now, this kind of flight made him discover another side of himself, an eagerness for excitement, a desire to challenge limits. The feeling of conquering life and death in the midst of danger was irresistible. Maybe I was never a person who could stay put. Yes, perhaps I am not a law-abiding person by nature. Thinking like this, he became more and more bold in his flight. He thought of the aerobatic performances he had seen at air shows. Those pilots, operating planes indirectly through controls and dashboards, could still complete so many dazzling and exaggerated maneuvers. Now, controlling the flying broomstick himself, with several times the operability and flexibility of a pilot, there was no reason he couldn't perform those maneuvers. Riding the broomstick, he returned to the sky above the lawn. There was enough space there for him to practice aerobatic flying, of course, there was also a desire to show off, and then he began to dry. Dot. Dot.